Council. Judy, would you please call the roll? Yes, Wintrow. Here. Housh. Here. Sims. Here. McQueen. Here. Hempfling. Here. Also present are our planner, Denise Swinger, uh, village solicitor, Chris Connard, village manager, Patty Bates, and assistant village manager, Melissa Dodd. Thank you. And the first order of business is to swear in our new planning commission member, Frank Doden. Please come up to the podium and you have your, your swearing in statement in front of you if you'd like to read that. Okay. I should probably stand up. I solemnly affirm that I will support the Constitution and will obey the laws of the United States and the state of Ohio that I will in all respects observe the provisions of the charter and ordinances of the village of Yellow Springs and will faithfully discharge the duties of the office of Yellow Springs Planning Commission. Very good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us and for serving. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next on the agenda is announcements. Um, I will turn to uh, Brian House first. Okay, uh, I do have a few. Um, I did want to mention that uh, I think everybody knows tomorrow is election day. So if you have not voted early, uh, remember if you live in Yellow Springs uh, or the township, you vote at um, uh, Antioch University Midwest. Uh, the polls open at 6.30 a.m. and close at 7.30 p.m. I, I do want to say that it's not all areas of the township. Not all the township, Some right. of the township does vote in Cedarville. So, right, and I don't district. know where where they vote or what part of the township so that is a good point um, also on may uh, november 15th we are celebrating uh, 26 years that mayor fobert has served yellow springs that's going to be from 6 30 to 9 in rooms a and b here uh, at the john bryan community center and um, uh, part of the election also I meant to mention was uh, Mills Lawn School has its soups and souls, uh, which is a nice way to kick off the uh, or in the election day. Um, and then did we decide where the uh, Yellow Springs time exchange orientation will be on the 15th? Okay. So that's going to be from 7 to 8 here in council chambers. Thank you, Kat. Yeah. And that's on the 15th, correct? That is also on the 15th. Um, this weekend, Jesus Christ Superstar is going to be at the Little Art Theater. You can check out littleart.com for more information. Very exciting. And um, the final thing I wanted to mention is this Saturday, November 11th, um, from 5 to 8, we are going to uh, celebrate Priscilla Moore uh, and her retirement, uh, Mrs. Fubbs, at the Presbyterian Church. Anyone else? Yes, I, I have two announcements. One, first, I'd like to congratulate Patty Bates for having served more than 30 years as a public servant. How many years has it been? Um, 32. Wow. 32 years. She was a, got an award at the, what was the name? Um, International ICM. City County Management the, the, the International uh, City Management Conference. So Patty deserves our congratulations. She has been a very faithful servant for us and for everywhere she served, I believe. Thank you, Mary. Um, the other thing I'd like to announce, and this is very difficult, um, there was a post on Yellow Springs open discussion uh, on Saturday, uh, quite critical of uh, another person. Uh, the post, actually, John's here, so. I'll say, I wasn't going to say his name, um, by one member of the Village Justice Task Force criticizing another member of the Village Justice Task Force. Uh, it's my feeling that's very inappropriate to do publicly. There was also some information about some data that was uh, put in out of context. My primary concern, though, is that this uh, post was disparaging of David Turner who is a candidate running for village council and apparently the post the purpose of the post was to influence the election and it was done at a time uh, close enough to the election that David certainly had no opportunity to defend himself so 
I can't say how sorry I am that that happened. And I personally want to apologize as the alternate council liaison for the Village Justice Task Force. I want to apologize to David Turner for whatever impact it's had on him and to the Bill Springs Police Department which uh, information was put out there which totally out of context and has gone somewhat viral I think and uh, I think that's very unfortunate. What I will say though is uh, last weekend uh, I attended and a number of people from the village attended the restorative justice symposium and uh, this is a really complicated issue what's happened. I mean you know, clearly there are a lot of different viewpoints but I did contact Jennifer Bierman because I think that this is a situation in which restorative justice can be applied. Jennifer uh, said she would be happy to work on this and she will be calling people. So. And it is my understanding that that was Dave's desire. Dave, that Dave, was Mr. Turner actually yes, Dave, requested that there be Dave. a uh, restorative justice <coughs> yeah. um, circle. Sir, and, and I want to, as the as, as an outgoing council member and someone who's who's been here for 12 years, um, I want to add um, my um, dissatisfaction, my unhappiness with the post. Also, um, I I can't recall another time when. Um, Council and, and, and our commissions have been used in such a blatant political way and um, it violates the, to me, the integrity of the commission by the full commission not um, having a say so in how and when the information was released. So I think it's quite unfortunate. We do a pretty good job here, I believe, of, of keeping, even though we are a political body, I think we do a pretty good job of keeping ourselves as active participants out of the current political election process. And it's unfortunate that we had to be thrown into it in this way. Um, as the liaison to the justice system task force, I have a few things I want to say about this as well. Um, first thing, because uh, I think it's brought some important issues to light. First thing I'd like to say, I'd like to do is just um, read from Lori Askelin's email today. Um, she was asking for records related to this issue in which she says, I understand that apparently the justice system task force voted at their last public meeting not to release the document that was included in their packet, but my understanding of Sunshine Law is that actually that they actually have no authorization to make such a decision. In fact, it runs directly contrary to what I understand to be the letter and spirit of Sunshine Law. These are public bodies holding public meetings, and these are already public documents regardless of any votes taken. And um, I, I want to apologize to the council and the task force because I think I should have uh, provided leadership to have made that clear to the committee that it wasn't, uh, you know, something that the committee should have been talking about in that way, that it really, we didn't really have the authority as a committee to be doing that. I think part of the reason there's such a firestorm, a bit of a firestorm, small little firestorm here in Yellow Springs about this is the is the results of that is the central finding of that report which um, regarding our police department which um, indicates that black residents receive at least 1.45 it was it needed to be corrected um, more citations than white residents and I think uh, the discomfort there was a great discomfort in the committee with com with how to come forth with that information um, the last council meeting, or the last justice task force meeting, which um, in which it was discussed, none of our members of color were present. Um, I just watched uh, this discussion. You know, finally got this the DVD. One thing that was really evident is my memory of what happened was quite different than what it looked like was happening. And what it looked like was happening was that the whole committee, uh, except for John Hemfling, uh, was uncomfortable and was, you know, wanting to kind of hold back on uh, presenting the findings until we came up with the right way to do it, which, you know, did not reflect real well, I think, on the committee as a whole. Um, 
I think it was the committee as a whole. When, when I watched it, it really was the committee as a whole that was uncomfortable. And the only person who had any clarity was our youngest member, which was John. Um, I, uh, I think transparency is essential to democratic, democratic governments and just the look of this thing, it just didn't look right, you know, is the way it looks to me. Um, but um, because we seem to be more, more concerned about uh, the, how this would reflect on our police department and rather than we seem to be more concerned about that than um, how it was reflecting upon the persons who were being more frequently stopped by the police department in our community. Um, I think when it comes to issues of race, we are so, uh, we have a lot of confusion. Excuse me. Um, Thank you. When it comes to issues of race, there's a lot of confusion and it's understandable um, because our history and culture is saturated with racism. So people get confused and I do think that it's not helpful to shame them or, but that, uh, you know, but we need to try to hold ourselves, us white people need to hold ourselves to, you know, a high standard of, of trying to be really thoughtful when we're engaging on these kind of issues. Um, I know Mary Ann has made a recommendation that we put limits on uh, the people who uh, are appointed to our committees, uh, what seems to me a limit to their ability to fully participate in the public process, in the political process uh, of our democratic community, of our democratic uh, governance. And I know we're probably not going to talk about that now, but I do think that that is the wrong direction to go. Um, and I, so I, I will object to that direction. And I think that's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I do have a couple of things that I hope are a little bit more pleasant. Um, the, we have a big event coming up in a couple of weeks, um, Art and Soul. It is on November, 6, November 18th at um, Mills Lawn School from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. It's a very nice art show. Uh, a lot of the proceeds, there's a lot of benefits to the Yellow Springs Police Department, also to Mills Lawn School. And then tentatively on Tuesday, uh, November 21st, um, we're talking about having a cere ceremonial uh, tree lighting um, down near the, the point where uh, close to Mills Park Hotel over um, in the, the, where the large tree is at Jackson Lytle Funeral Home. Those plans are still unfolding, but since uh, I don't believe we'll have another meeting before that, I wanted to, um, yes we will, will we have another meeting before mm -hmm. that? Okay, the 21st. Um, so it will be, I just wanted to get it out there so that people are thinking about it, but we will follow up, I will follow up to let you know if it's actually happening. Um, okay, consent agenda, we have the minutes of October 16th, regular meeting and the treasurer's report. Uh, I'll entertain a motion. So oh, moved. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Uh, review of the agenda, um, is there anything, let's see, that we want to add, um, remove, or um, yes. relocate? You know, it was my understanding that when the Justice System Task Force um, had a recommendation that we would only take one at a time, <coughs> and there are two listed on the agenda, the um, police uh, outreach specialist and the taser policy, I think uh, especially the former will take some discussion time, and I'd like to suggest that we move the taser to another meeting so we have adequate time. Because I anticipate, I see people are here, and I imagine that there will be citizens concern as well. Um, I, I mean, th that would be fine with me, Chief. It, it's your. I was, I was going to suggest we pull it off, uh, just because it seems like a very full agenda, okay. and I agree that that so discussion is going to be a longer discussion. Should we schedule it for the twentieth? I'm not going to be here if there's some, uh, so I think maybe we should make it the first December 4th, okay, yes, December please. 4th, okay. Oh, I'm not going to be here either. And I do need to add a very short executive session at the end um, for uh, potential litigation. Uh, 
Uh, anything else? The, the, I wanted to, to make a comment on... Oh, I'm sorry, um, Jerry. Yeah. Um, I, re I read the post, and, and I've heard the discussion and so forth. Uh, some may think it's unfortunate, and some may think it, it's not. But, you know, when, uh, when you run the, for public office, office, you do expose yourself to, to some criticism. Uh, John chose to use some information that he received. It was a public meeting. He made a post and he expressed his personal opinion, not the opinion of the Justice Task Force. That, that was his opinion. Okay. Uh, and, and I see that as no different than the newspaper making uh, their uh, comments on, on elections and so forth. Uh, some may say that the timing was bad, but we are in a technology age and Yellow Springs likes Facebook. So if we happen to follow that, we do have opportunities to challenge what s someone says. Um, but we're also in, in, in a different age where um, we do not want to stymie conversations and comments, and we do not want to discourage our young people from stepping forward. Now, on the other side of that, we, we have our, an obligation to help train our young folks. But we have to understand that times, times are changing. Uh, my personal opinion is the elections tomorrow, uh, had I not got the uh, email this afternoon, I would have never seen the article. And voters are intelligent enough to make their own choices. But I don't want to ever see a stymie young, old, middle-aged from, from making comments. Okay, as long as the information that they're putting out is factual, uh, I really don't have a problem with it. And, and I would hope that within all of our commissions that folks can voice their dissent if they disagree with what's being presented. But on the other hand, once the whole group makes the decision, and I feel you have that, that obligation to follow that decision. So it's, it's, it's a touchy area, but uh, we, we learn from events and we learn from activities. And, and I think this whole episode is a learning experience for, for all of us on how and when to use Facebook when we present information. Thanks, Jerry. Okay, and actually, um, I was not going to say anything, but I feel that I want to make it clear what my position is on this. Um, there are really two issues that have been expressed. One is a process piece with our commissions. And one thing I want to make very clear is there was never any suggestion that this report was not going to come out, come to the community and to council. What I understand the task force was doing was working on how that was going to be presented to council, and that is something our commissions do, and, and we ask them to do. That's part of why we have commissions to build capacity. But I do want to emphasize my bigger concern, and one thing that was not clear in that post is when someone is speaking as a citizen, they need to be very clear about that as opposed to their position on a commission, a task force, or anything else that's sanctioned by village council. That's the real issue here. And we've had, uh, and we will talk about this later in the packet, we put together roles and responsibilities that lay this out because that had been a problem in the past. People not being clear about when they're using, uh, when they're speaking as a citizen versus using their position on a commission, which does give them at least an appearance of authority. This is very serious, and this is why all our commission members sign an agreement to roles and responsibilities, which again we'll look at later on. So uh, we have commission members in this room 
that are very good on social media about making that distinction. I want to make sure that all our commission members understand how important that is because not only does it put in the, does it implicate the task force, it also implicates village council as, as Karen mentioned and it's not appropriate behavior. Thank you. Okay, I just want to make sure we're done with this for now since I obviously moved on prematurely. Um, Okay, so we have removed something from the agenda, uh, or at least delayed it for another time. So, Brian, would you review the petitions and communications? Uh, yes. Um, so, we uh, received, uh, there's a flyer about a nuisance tree workshop um, that uh, I would suggest taking a look at if you uh, have some issues with nuisance trees. Um, the Greene County Public Health Department um, submitted a, uh, a press release about the walk to school day that happened a few weeks ago at Mills Lawn School, very successful. Um, we also uh, have a flyer about a hazard tree workshop. Um, I mentioned uh, before the um, uh, the upcoming uh, um, time bank uh, orientation. And um, Cat Walter also submitted a letter about uh, trucks being on Fairfield Pike and made a recommendation that we uh, put a stop sign uh, to make that a safer place because it is a very narrow road and people do uh, walk and bike on that road. Um, Chris Erbuchen, uh submitted a resignation as the alternate for our um, planning commission. Um, there was a very nice letter from Mary Evans thanking Officer Beam. Uh, I was really touched by it. Uh, she is someone who's had some issues, uh, was able to uh, get an education at Antioch, and then was supported by community members to get on her feet. And uh, she has highlighted just how that's turned her life around. And uh, she appreciated one of our officers uh, being very helpful at, at a recent stop. Um, Matt Reed weighed in on his thoughts about transient guest lodging and particularly the concern about taking properties off the market um, in, in doing this activity and this is something we're also going to talk about later on in the meeting. Uh, Wendy Van Buren uh, from the Ohio Department of Natural Resources um, talked about the Yell Springs Tree Program and complimented our staff and the Tree Committee on their great work. And we got a great status update from Bowen on the housing needs assessment. There were also two things on the table that I will mention that came after the packet. Uh, one was from Eric Clark, and uh, he was following up on what we've labeled Airbnb, but we understand that Airbnb is one of many platforms for transient guest lodging. And uh, there are several points, but uh, the main thing he emphasized again was um, public participation in the process and thinking about the proper balance in um, legislation for this kind of activity. And we also got a letter from Kate Hamilton supporting the direction that um, uh, Chief Carlson is taking with the outreach specialist uh, position, which is also going to be on the agenda, so we'll talk about that later. I'd like to come back to Kate's or Kat's letter. Um, I would like to request that the police department consider that request of putting a stop sign on Fairfield. Uh, at least investigate that. I've had other, I know other people on Fairfield who have complained about the speed that, and it, it is, it's a dangerous road. It's not safe for walking, it's not safe for biking, and I know there is speeding. So, is that, Chief, is that something that? Yes. Um I met with Kat was it last week. A word. Mm -hmm. um, the the only thing that I'd like to think about and have your thoughts on are when if and when we do place a sign there, well that creates now a, a noise environment for the residents on all four sides of that sign. Mm -hmm. um, specifically motorcycles, uh, anything with a loud engine that starts and stops. So um, but I'm definitely uh, <coughs> curious and anxious to try to come up with some solution to that road because it is a cut through. 
So people going to work from Springfield, heading toward Fairborn, coming back, Quite for that and, and Chief, could you please, and maybe you want to come up for this, explain the, why the trucks are there at this particular time? Um, because I know they're for a, they're not normally supposed to be on that road. Correct. correct. Um, typically, they should have contacted the police department to get permission or the village manager's office for an actual permit. But within the code, the ordinance that we have, um, they are. You, using that roadway for a specific purpose temporarily. Right now they're repaving 343 and John Bryan Road all the way down to Grinnell. Um, that's supposed to be completed this by the end of this week, weather permitting. So, and I'm not sure, uh, Kat, if you've noticed a decrease in those at all since we talked. Okay. <laughs> we have been... <laughs> we have been running radar there regularly. They're not speeding, they're just giant noisy trucks and so they can you know have that overwhelming uh, appearance and feeling when you're there and and there isn't any other reason it, this, this is just temporary there other than Correct. those trucks They're there hasn't the been travel for the roadway well I would certainly hate to make a decision based upon a temporary situation mm -hmm. um, and we but also we've had have the work going in we also have the sidewalk going in and I'm not sure in what proximity to the yeah, we have a and, lot going on right now on that right. road. Right. I mean, it seems like maybe before we we should at least let that project get finished mm -hmm. and see what that does for traffic and safety. Okay. Kat, I, would you like to add anything? I was going to say too that I mean we've we've heard complaints about speeding on that road for years and nothing's really changed. I think the sidewalk's going to help some. Um, but I, at least for part of the road, but uh. right from I think it's from high to winter pleasant mm -hmm. somewhere in there. So thank you for at least considering this. Um, so s speeding is it happens on that road quite a bit. Um, and since there has been an electronic mm -hmm. uh, speed sign put up <laughs> facing east as you're coming to the village, that has slowed it down because before that, Steward, my partner, purchased a radar gun because <laughs> we were trying to figure out, we'd be sitting out back some evenings and we were trying to figure out if it was just our perception that people were speeding if they were how much. So he got a radar gun and checked it and so sometimes, yes, it seems that vehicles are going faster than they really are. Um, but with the truck situation, um, so speeding does happen, it's better, it's still a concern and it is a thoroughfare. So regardless of the truck issue, I, I would recommend something. I know there are humps, they're called. They're not speed bumps, and they slow traffic. They're not noisy, and I know they're a pain in the butt for people driving there, but you know, if it slows you down a little bit, that can help. The truck issue, though, I, I question whether it really is a good idea to allow trucks on that road where children walk after school, people walk dogs, elderly people are out there. Um, I understand you know, it, it can help. Um, companies around the area to have that be a thoroughfare, but and it's, I guess a better choice than 68 through town. But is that really a, a good answer? Um, you know, is it possible for trucks to go up Polcat and take Jackson? I know it would be um, less than ideal for these companies, but it really is dangerous, and they do speed. Um, they are continuing to speed, and it's not always. You know, but it's it's a concern, and it's not just noise; it's an actual danger. So perhaps, Chief, you could talk to the trucking company, or talk to the construction company. Talk to the is this a state project? Mm -hmm. Talk to ODOT. I did. I spoke with Barrett, the construction company, and uh, he gave me his number. Said contact him anytime. There's there's some discrepancy. He went and did a visual inspection of the vehicles there. You know, it's a it's a state high-end operation. We've had situations before on the field in the past where this call has been made and it's a, you know, an operation of a few people and when we did pull over one of those vehicles, the tires weren't compliant, he didn't have a driver's license, so that was a good thing. This is not that. Um, you know, they're, they're maintaining the roadway and it's a projected three-week plan. And perhaps it's saving 
a trip, maybe I would I would assume that there are, that there are road miles being saved by taking this route, and that that's probably one of the reasons sure. that they're taking this route. So I think that there's always trade-offs. I, I agree. I guess I question what the balance is worth. Right. So and, thank and, you. Right. You know. Um, and the other thing, I mean, I also per perhaps talking with the, with the township, it does seem like we need to post that that road sooner. We need to post coming coming east. It needs to be posted that it's residential coming up. It seems like it's all of a sudden, and I don't know if it transitions down from 60 to 45 and then down to 25, but that might be something to talk to the township about. Is there a way to put signs? out by their building just to transition people so that they understand that they're coming up in a residential neighborhood. Yeah, that's the subject that we talked about you know, downstairs regarding more signage, more visual, maybe some different types of signage, um, coffee children, you know, just those kinds of things as well. But um, I'm open to any ideas. I, I'd really like to see this year a digital going the other way. Um, right. If mm -hmm. we can afford it, it would be nice to have the, the digital sign that tells you your speed um, in relation to the speed limit. Right. Yeah, I think that's made a big difference, as Kat mentioned, at least mm -hmm. coming in. Um, I do want to emphasize that with the active transportation plan that we're going to be developing, Fairfield will be a target and that is going to be happening soon. And one of the things that we've learned is that Fairfield is one of the three roads in Yellow Springs that um, qualifies for federal funding. So that could be our road that, because we can select one road that we want to develop into a project out of this planning process, and maybe that's the one to do it with. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let's move on to public hearings and legislation. Uh, first reading of Ordinance 2017-33, Judy, by title only, please. Yes, this is repealing Section 1258.01 District Uses and Section 1262.08 Specific Requirements of the Codified Ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio and enacting new section 1258.01 District Uses and new section 1262.08 Specific Requirements. Thank you. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Okay. Um, Denise or Chris? So this was tabled at the last meeting um, with some questions. Um, we council directed uh, Brian and Judith um, to look at, Judith was especially um, wanting to come up with some language um, to um, address some of the concerns that she's had about um, the transient lodging that went to Brian and Judith. They've been talking to Chris, so it's kind of coming back to us again. Um, and Chris is going to kind of take us through where we've been and what this legislation does. Good evening, Council. Um, so following the last Council meeting, we went back and we, we continued our discussion that has been uh, really uh, been won that has progressed and evolved uh, since the discussion of lodging tax uh, first uh, was put on the table. Um, we had a meeting with staff and we recognize that there are um, some interesting, um, I would call it uh, uh, pros and cons to Airbnb in the context of, in one aspect, Airbnb can make housing affordable because people can rent out their rooms or portions of their, their lodging to uh, make some income. On the other hand, there is anecdotal evidence in some of the larger cities that Airbnb can have negative impacts. And uh, there are large cities such as New York, Nashville, San Diego um, have uh, uh, are struggling with that. There is litigation uh, pending nationally uh, that's been brought by private property owners about restrictions on Airbnb. Um, it's an evolving area of law. Um, there were discussions here within the village, as people are aware of, whether or not we should make this a conditional use, a permitted use. Um, from the beginning of the process, I think that there was an acknowledgement by everyone, just as when we were discussing the new zoning code, that there's an opportunity to go back and revisit these issues um, to find out what the exact impact is on the village, and as well because of the affordable housing study. 
So in light of that, um, I think that there was a consensus that was reached uh, that, that staff felt appropriate because they also have some concerns about um, the enforcement issue. It is a challenge. Um, we are in the process of writing the regulations that will be uh, used to give uh, villagers guidance, um, and that data will be tracked. Uh, and so in, in weighing all of these factors, um, the legislation today um, reflects that uh, the zoning code would be changed to one, make it consistent so that we don't have a reference anymore to short-term rental, so that we have consistency in the language, and that the, uh, the uh, establishment of a uh, transient guest lodging uh, business would be a permitted use uh, while this process of rolling things out and, and understanding how it might impact the village would likely be in the best interest and that's the recommendation that's currently before council. Um, yeah, I guess I'd like to speak to the, or do you want to go ahead and see about questions? Okay. Um, so um, the, the, I've been talking with Ellis uh, Jacobs and Matt Reed, who is the chair of our planning commission about this as well as Brian and Chris um, and Denise um, and other people in town. Uh, the, the issue seems to be primarily an issue between, um, I mean, Ellis was telling me, you know, in some neighborhoods, because he and uh, Desiree have gone to Airbnbs, where there's whole neighborhoods that are Airbnbs, and that the people that are still present are quite hostile about the fact that their neighborhoods are no longer neighborhoods, and that it's not a pretty thing, and that they were actually thinking of stop using Airbnb because of the impact, the negative impacts they were seeing in the neighbor, the places they were, they, they were renting Airbnbs. <laughs> The issue seems to be, you know, it cuts both ways, as Chris said. It's an affordability thing for not just owners, but also tenants to rent a room in their apartment um, to make it, you know, to help pay the rent. And that could be, and that's you know, given that our community is becoming more expensive, that's, that can be a good thing for a lot of people. And, you know, visitors aren't bad people. We just, you know, we just don't want them taking over our neighborhoods so we no longer have neighborhoods. The problem, is, I guess, in Yellow Springs right now, there are five houses that are now being used. They are not a primary residence of anybody. They are just Airbnbs. And this has happened fairly quickly. And, you know, we don't, I think we do not want this to continue. Um, it's, um, it is, we've already got a very restrictive um, housing market. They tend to be very modest homes that this is happening to, so they are the affordable homes that we would hope, you know, uh, young families could afford or, you know, people of, of modest income. So, you know, I would like to ask Chris uh, to do more research. I mean, I talked to Ellis about it, and he said there is, you know, people, there are restrictions, there are um, communities that are, you know, have things on the books that are, you know, have stood up to the law, he felt, and we just, we want to get more information, I want more information, and, and the place I would like to see the restriction is on these, you know, non, there's not a primary resident, whether they're a tenant or an owner, they're, they are just being used for Airbnbs, we've got, you know, the, and if that starts to happen, where there's this house here and there are these strangers here, but there's nobody there that's a neighbor, you know, that's where I think, I don't, I don't mind having a bunch of you know, visitors in the neighborhood, as long as I know who lives there, I think that to me that seems to be the place where we should try to be restricting is those kind of, that kind of uh, a use. So, but I think we need more information. So that's why, you know, we talked, we decided rather than make, because when I talked to Denise, it didn't sound like the, um, the, uh, uh, what's the word I want? Um, conditional use was very meaningful because the conditions were not were not very meaningful, you know. So, uh, you know, it just seemed like uh, people had to come in front of planning commission. I expected younger people or tenants would maybe not be comfortable with that process. Um, you know, it's a little onerous uh, for some people, and that it wasn't very meaningful. That the council should establish some, you know, find out what is legal and then try to establish some of those. Uh, restrictions so that's what we were thinking I, I want to talk um, first of all I don't you know the idea of a meaningful conditional use the part of the reason you do a conditional use is is the impact on the neighbors so I I would assume that that hearing before um, planning commission in a conditional use situation would be of meaning to those neighbors 
who are going to be impacted by whether there is, is a transient dwelling unit. Um, I'm going to support this just because I want to get it off our table. I know we need to legally, I want to get it off the table, but you know, conditional use is there for a reason. We have it there for um, home businesses. We have it there for um, a number, mill works, almost every use in mill works is, is conditional use because we recognize that a use other than a dwelling of a family or an individual is could potentially have ramifications on the neighborhood and on the neighbor. So I just want to make sure we keep that, that we don't demonize conditional uses. Conditional use is a permitted use with conditions that take into consideration the neighborhoods and any impact that that use might have on the neighbors or the community. It could actually take care of your concerns about too many Airbnbs or what it might be doing to the block, what it might be doing to the community. So I don't think that, I, I expect that while I'm on council, I'm not gonna, I'm not, we're gonna, we're gonna go through this one as a permitted use. You guys will all take it from there some other time. But um, I think that honestly, this should be a, a, a conditional use. I think that transient guest lodging, the end of the day, should be a conditional use. And I think as Chris learns more, as Denise learns more, perhaps you can craft conditions that make sense. But I think ultimately that's what it should be. And you know, I, I, I have a feeling that this, this issue of what's happening, the gentrification, what's happening in other, in other communities, we're talking about New York City, we're talking about San Francisco, we're talking about Asheville, we're talking about resort, we're talking about Aspen, we're talking about resort communities where people can get $1,000 a night and more for their house. Uh, I will tell you that there is, I, I don't believe that an investment, that, that doing an Airbnb as an investment property in Yellow Springs makes math sense. Um, between the cost of managing, the cost of cleaning, all of the costs that surround operating an Airbnb, I don't believe you can do it as an, as an off-site owner and make money, certainly not with the cost of housing in Yellow Springs. So I think we're, I think we're, you know, we're also concerned about something that I don't know is really um, going to happen in Yellow Springs. Again, I'm going to, I'm going to support this particular piece of legislation as an interim piece and hope that after the, the housing needs assessment comes through and other research is done that we can come to some language that, that you know, maybe attacks and, or addresses the situation in a little bit um, more accurate way. Um, can I just ask Judith a question? In your write-up, you mentioned um, continuing the discussion in December. Uh -huh. um, I, and, and so I guess it occurs to me, I think we should either make a decision that we're going to, I guess, continue this discussion in this configuration of council or restart it right. at the beginning of the year, unless I'm missing something. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're passing this legislation. I, I assume that we're hearing this legislation over the next two meetings. If it's approved, that will be the ordinance. It will be transient guest lodging will be a permitted use everywhere that it's permitted in, in the village. And really nothing else needs to be addressed until council decides they want to modify it. So you're saying wait till January till the new council comes on. I don't know. Uh, I mean, I'm talking to Brian. And, I think uh, that makes more and then, sense. And that gives Chris time to gather that information. That sounds fine. Okay. But, One of the other things I did want to add is just to make sure that everything's clear here is that there will still be a requirement that one obtain a permit so that we have that information about who's engaged in the business. So the fact that if council does approve a permitted use, you still have to register and provide the, the, rel you know, the necessary information. Is there any requirement to inform neighbors? We can certainly build that into the, the internal process of how the village chooses to I mean, Overseas. again, it's about parking. Short, I mean, parking short answer, is the a short huge, answer is yes. It is, is a huge I'll, issue. I'll defer to Patty and Melissa on that, but I would imagine <coughs> it would be. It wouldn't be in this. It, 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 it would be if we, if we come back and revisit it. If it's, if it's a permitted use, um, then we don't normally notify the neighbors on permitted use. So um, if, if it can be built into the process in another way, 
um, then I would say that would not be a bad idea because I think that things like parking are going to be the biggest impact. But, um, you know, at this point, Denise, Denise and I have talked about this and um, we can go ahead and, and do it as a permitted use with the understanding that it, there are negative impacts that come up that, you know, start to negatively impact the neighborhoods, then we are going to have to revisit this. Um, but at this point, Denise has to be ready to start issuing permits um, the first of the year because that's what we've already put out there. So we need to have a process in place that tells her how to do that and under what conditions. Um, right now, what, what the legislation does is establishes transient guest lodging in any, as a permitted use in any um, zone that short-term rentals were previously permitted. Perhaps, Denise, would you review that a little bit? Just talk about which zones they're permitted in. Uh, the the uh, short-term lodging and now the um, <coughs> short-term rentals, which will be transient guest lodging, <coughs> are permitted in all uh, districts except for conservation and industrial. Both uh, both I-1 and I-2? Right. Okay. Yeah. So any other questions or comments from council? Um, I, I just wanted to clarify, or, or Denise, if you want to, um, maybe so everyone understands that transient guest lodging is not in Appendix A because Appendix A is about conditions. Correct. Any comments or questions from citizens? This is a, we will have two readings on this. We'll have their public hearing um, at the next meeting, but we do hear from, take citizen comments. Um, during both readings. Okay. Uh, Judy, would you please call the roll? Yes. Sims? Yes. Hempling? Yes. McQueen? Yes. Tausch? Yes. Wintrum? Yes. So now we have, I think, four or five more pieces of legislation related to this. We will hear, um, we will consider each one of them separately. Is my understanding that we may have modifications um, to make to the language. These are actually the second readings, so each one of these will have a, uh, a public hearing. So, Judy, title only? Yes, this is Ordinance 2017-34, repealing Section 1246.02, <coughs> Schedule of Uses of the Codified Ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting new Section 1246.02, Schedule of Uses. Denise? Yeah, yeah, and this is for allowing did you, did, it in the education. Did you want to go? A motion, motion, I'm sorry, a motion. So moved. Second. This is allowing it in the educational institution district. Um, we do need a friendly amendment because <clears throat> it's currently un it's currently conditional. So if we could just have an amendment to make it permitted. So moved. Second. I'm sorry. Who was the motion? Me. Judith. And Jerry was a second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Um, any, are you, you're done? Mm -hmm. Any comments or questions, Council? I will open the public hearing for comments. Seeing and hearing none, Judy, would you please call the roll? Yes, Housh. Yes. Sims. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Hempling. Yes. Wintrow. Yes. Uh, this is allowing. Well, hold on. <clears throat> so I'll just roll Sorry. on through. Yeah, just roll okay. on through. Okay. So we're on Ordinance 2017-35, which is repealing Section 1248.02, Schedule of Uses of the Codified Ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting new Section 1248.02, Schedule of Uses. Can I have a motion, please? So move. Second. Denise? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Heard that vote, and I thought we'd pass that motion. Sorry. Um, this is for allowing a transit guest lodging in uh, residential A, B, and C, and I'll need a friendly amendment to making it permitted in those three districts. But you need the friendly so amendment. Yes, yeah, start with that. We move. So move. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Um, so I will open the public hearing for this ordinance. Seeing and hearing no comments, Judy, would you please call the roll? Yes, McQueen. Yes. Hempling? Yes. Sims? Yes. Housh? Yes. Wintrow? Yes. Okay. Moving on, we're at Ordinance 2017-36, repealing Section 1250.02, Schedule of Uses of the Codified Ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting new Section 1250.02, Schedule of Uses. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. 
Second. And this is <coughs> for transient guest lodging in business one and business two. Again, a friendly amendment to make it permitted in both those districts. I, I move to make it permitted in both districts. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 I will open the public hearing for comment. Seeing and hearing none, Judy, would you please call the roll? Yes, Sims. Yes. Housh. Yes. Hempfling. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Wintrow. Yes. And we are at 2017-37, which is repealing section 1284.08 definitions R through S of the codified ordinances of the village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting new section 1284.08 definitions R through S. Can I get a motion, please? So move. Second. Second. And this is striking short-term rentals from definitions. Can, so um, oh, okay. Um, I will open the public hearing for comment. Seeing and hearing none, Judy, would you please call the roll? Yes. McQueen? Yes. Housh? Yes. Sims? Yes. Hempfling? Yes. Winter? Yes. And 2017-38 is repealing section 1284.09 definitions T through U of the codified ordinances of the village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting new section 1284.09 definitions T through U. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. And this is for allowing transit guest lodging in the definitions, which is a dwelling unit, a room or rooms in a dwelling unit, or an accessory dwelling unit where sleeping accommodations are offered for consideration to persons occupying a room or rooms for less than 30 consecutive days. Thank you. Um, I will open the public hearing. Seeing and hearing none, Judy, would you please call the roll? I guess I should have asked counsel if you had any comment. <laughs> Judy, please call the roll. Uh, Hempfling? Yes. McQueen? Yes. Sims? Yes. Housh? Yes. Wintrow? Yes. And now for something slightly different. This is okay. Ordinance 2017-39, repealing Appendix B, Village of Yellow Springs <coughs> Recommended Trees in Part 12, Planning and Zoning Code, Title II, Planning of the Codified Ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting new Appendix B, Village of Yellow Springs Recommended Trees. Okay. Um, can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Denise. Okay, Appendix B is a document in the zoning code. It's actually in the planning section of the zoning code. <clears throat> it's linked to the um, landscaping requirements in 122606, design standards. Um, <clears throat> if you look, I don't know how your packet is set up, but if you look at the exhibit A, exhibit Appendix B that's in red, that is the most recent. It's titled in red. I don't know if you've got yeah. it. We don't have any colors yeah. it's in the paper. Yeah, it's, we have that, yeah. It's, It'll be this one right. with the red head. Yes. That one is the latest. Mm -hmm. we've got it. Okay. And so I met again with um, Wendy Van Buren. We actually had a sit down from uh, Ohio Department of Natural <coughs> Resources along with uh, Jason Hamby, the street department, and we just further clarified this listing. Um, this listing is is for not only, even though it's in the landscaping requirements for new developments, it's also a suggested list for residents as well for their own uh, personal properties. So we hope that changing this around a little bit more, uh, tweaking it uh, so that it further explains tree lawn versus your own yard uh, should make it more understandable for you. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, council, any comments or questions? I'm trying, is this, this is the second reading. I will open the public hearing. Seeing and hearing none, Judy, would you please call the roll? Yes, McQueen? Yes. Housh? Yes. Sims? Yes. Hempfling? Yes. Wintrow? Yes. And next we have Ordinance 2017-40, repealing Section 1226.06 Design Standards of the Codified Ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting new Section 1226.06 Design Standards. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. So what is this? Second. ADA compliant. Mm -hmm. It's the ADA compliant update. I thought we already did that. <laughs> I was pretty sure we'd already care well, about it. I think this is the second reading. Yeah, it's okay. just it's just okay. the amendment that makes every all okay. sidewalks to require. All right. Making. And I think it added um, the it, trees recommended tree list was yeah, included it was the too. Recommended yeah. tree list. It just yeah. Oh, uh, reference. What we reference that appendix B. Mm -hmm. 
So do we? That's that's it. It was really for the the appendix B because it was it's linked to that document. Okay. So we're saying we don't have a ordinance, or we do? We do. We do. We do. Okay. Um, I'll open the public hearing since it's a second reading. Seeing and hearing none, Judy, would you please call the roll? Yes, indeed. Housh? Yes. McQueen? Yes. Helfling? <clears throat> yep. Sims? Yes. Wintrow? Yes. Now you're done. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> Denise. Thank you, Denise. Um, let's read this, the ordinance 2017-41. Let's at least read the totals, Judy. Unless, are you, were you going to review all this, Melissa? Um, there was a request for um, some graphics on expenditures, and okay. so I had so, four slides. Okay, so let's just read it, and it. let's just read them by title only, and we'll let um, Melissa do the explanation. Gladly. This is 2017-41, approving the 2018 annual appropriations and declaring an emergency for the village of Yellow Springs, Ohio. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Okay. Uh, Melissa. Queen. Okay, so this is the um, the grand finale of the uh, 2018 budget. So I know that there was a request for some um, graphics on the expenditures, and I did one on revenues as well. Um, so this is this is a very brief presentation um, that ties in with the ordinance. Um, it's very self-explanatory. Um, the first slide that we have after the title slide here is the. Uh, the overall budget and then the uh, four sections in which it is uh, divided out into we have uh, the largest the largest piece of our budget is dedicated to enterprise funds at 55 percent and those uh, expenditures or appropriations for 2018 total five million eight hundred and forty two thousand seven hundred and eighty eight so that includes our electric water sewer and solid waste funds um, the second largest section of our budget is our general fund, and that makes up 32% of the total. The, totals, uh, the total for the general fund is $3,313,092. And then um, the third, third largest um, would be the special revenue funds at 11%. This includes our streets, parks, um, and then there are a variety of other smaller funds that are included, but streets and parks are the largest. That total is $1,167,986 for 2018. And then the uh, fourth and smallest um, section of the budget are our capital project funds, which is kind of a newly invigorated um, area of the budget in which we are uh, starting to commit to um, in 2018, which we have minimally in the prior years. But that total for 2018 is 239700 so that gives us total appropriations for 2018 at 10 million five hundred sixty three thousand five hundred and sixty six and then if we go to the next slide this is just a very um, a very brief look at our general fund revenues um, it breaks everything down um, into all of the individual lines that we have um, for the 2018 budget and if we'll uh, just briefly look at this we can see that of the total general fund revenues income tax makes up the most at 55 percent our real estate taxes are 29 percent collectively and then um, after that everything is split up with less than 10 percent devoted to state shared taxes um, kilowatt hour taxes miscellaneous receipts fines and permits and then the newly um, the newly established lodging tax so those general fund revenues for 2018 are predicted to be 3,449,715, which are not part of the appropriations um, ordinance that we have tonight, but still a very relevant piece of the discussion. And then the next, um, for some reason, that really kind of jumbled things a little bit. Um, oh, it put the title on there, and it's not on the one that I printed. Um, so this is general fund expenditures. Um, this is broken. This is bro broken down everything into the individual departments, as well as the uh, amount that's taken out for transfers. Um, so, as we look at all of these charts, we've got the the pie chart on the left that shows kind of where all of those things are allocated in the percentage, and then on the right we've got the numbers that are folded into the uh, ordinance. Um, so we've got our general fund expenses, um, the total three million three hundred thirteen thousand ninety two dollars. Um, we've got public safety making up 44% of that. The transfers um, out to other uh, funds at 28%, with the majority of that going to streets and parks. 
some of our uh, capital improvement funds, um, police pension fund, and then we've got uh, administration at 11%, council at 8%, and then the rest, um, very small amounts, uh, just under 10% uh, each. Um, so that's general fund expenses. And then the last slide, um, as part of this presentation, um, I didn't do I didn't do any breakdowns for the uh, special revenue funds or the capital improvement funds because those uh, those are not as uh, not as easy to present. Um, the general fund and the enterprise funds um, are, are usually the ones that everybody focuses on. The special revenue funds, there's not a whole lot that goes on in those, and the capital improvement funds. Were already um, those expenditures were already approved as part of the capital budget, which could always be referred back to. So, the final slide is the enterprise fund expenses. So this shows a uh, um, out of the total five five million eight hundred forty two thousand seven hundred eighty eight, we have sixty three percent of that goes to the electric fund, which the majority of that are our power costs. Um, we've got sixteen percent water, sixteen percent sewer, and then five percent solid waste. So that is, in a nutshell, the uh, 2018 budget in a graphic format along with the ordinance. So if anybody has any would, questions. Would you get, what's the total? Would you do, I don't. Yes, the total expenditures, 10,563,566. Okay. I have two questions. Yes. One is about uh, debt mm -hmm. and how much we're paying on debt. We're, where would that come out, and what would be the biggest? I mean, I would assume maybe it's the water plant. Is that? Yes, and the water plant, we don't have um, the final amortization schedule because not all of the draws have been made for that loan. Um, so we don't have that, that final number yet. Um, I estimate that it's going to be about a $350,000 a year debt service payment, um, but I don't have that, that total yet. Um, so the the debt service payments are folded into the individual funds in which that debt originates. So um, like the loop completion and the bottleneck elimination projects, those were two water distribution projects. So we've got a, um, we've got a debt service line within the water distribution budget and that's where those loan payments are. So if you refer back to the original presentations, um, you'll see the line that says, um, I, I forget what it's labeled um, off the top of my head, and I don't want to say that the wrong way, but um, actually Patty's got that there. There, there is a line that um, is very clearly marked that would show that. Um, let me find one on the enterprise funds just so that you can see. Oh, it's actually labeled debt service. Would so, you estimate that we spend less than 10% of our expenses on debt? I wouldn't want to speculate. Um, and once the once it just depends on what fund we're talking about. The general fund doesn't really carry any debt. It's the enterprise funds that mostly carry the debt. So I really wouldn't want to speculate. And because each of those budgets um, are very different in terms of their expenditures, obviously the electric fund has a much larger budget because of our power costs um, in relation to the debt. Um, so I I wouldn't want to speculate and give a number that would address each of the funds. But I could definitely uh, break that debt down per fund if you would like that for yeah, the next know what meeting. The, I mean, it would be pretty easy. What What's the debt service on the water lines project? I don't. Okay, never mind. Yeah, I don't. I, I, I don't, I don't have it in front of me. I'm sorry. Okay, we'll do I do have time. the amortization schedules on a one-page sheet in my office, so that's really easy to see uh, when the loans started and when the loans will end and what the annual payment is and how much is allocated to interest and to uh, principal. So I do have that as well. The reason why I'm asking is because one of the news feeds that I get about local government said that it, I think it was 10 percent, that you don't, it, it, you know, that's a sign of health of the local government if you have 10 percent or less mm -hmm. in debt service. So, yeah, but I think I, that given the fact that we really don't have any debt at all <laughs> in the general fund is, yeah, and once I mean, we paid off the Bryan Center, what, two, two years ago, I think, um, last year? I think last year was the last payment. And that was really the only debt we had And there. that was only $69,000. And, and Mary Ann, I'd also like to point out that in a general way that is true, but municipalities carry their debt in so many different ways mm -hmm. um, that 
that can also be a false predictor. So, I mean, because we don't assess any of our debt, um, we do it through through rate increases. If, if a municipality assesses their debt onto the property taxes of, of the citizens, then it doesn't show up as debt, it, it shows up in a different way. So you just have to be kind of careful to make sure you explain exactly how you carry your debt as well. I wanted to say the uh, pie charts are really helpful. I think they are they just make things very much easier for myself and I imagine citizens to understand in terms of where we're getting our money from, where it's, how, you know, what we're putting, what we're spending. So I appreciate you doing that. And I didn't have that um, presentation in the packet, but I can put it in the I was going to add like a hard time. copy at some mm -hmm. point. That'd be great. Thank you. And, and then the other question I had, thank you, um, is um, whether the extra 20000 for the outreach specialist for the police department is included in this budget? It was included because it was part of the last budget presentation um, and it was supposed to kind of, the last budget presentation was supposed to go hand in hand. It was on the agenda at that time. So I left it in and I never removed it. So it is included in the police department's total in this ordinance. Okay. Well, I, I have talked to Chief Carlson, both about the position and about the added expense, and I have to say I'm somewhat confused still about the expense because I know things are changing. But uh, I have two concerns. One, I don't like to approve money for something that we haven't actually approved. In other words, we have not approved that specialist position. And secondly, uh, originally it was discussed that, that new position, which I do support uh, the concept of, be co come out of the police budget as it is and not be an additional expense. So I'm requesting that for this budget at this point that that 20000 be removed. I think you need to make a motion. Okay, I'm, I make a motion that the $20,000 for the uh, police outreach specialist be removed from the 2018 budget. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Nay. Aye. Nay. So what was it? <laughs> Carried or passed? Uh, three of us voted yes. Okay. So what will be removed, Melissa? So then um, the way that that would change, so the ordinance would pass um, with the exception that the the police uh, public safety total would be um, deducted $20,000. So that new total would be 1,461,000, or I'm sorry, 459,602. Nope, 441,602. And then that would um, also affect the total appropriations, 10,500,043,556. Sixty-six. I'm sorry. Lots of numbers in front of me right now. So it will be deducted from the general fund um, out of the police department, and then the total general fund appropriations would also be reduced, and then the grand total appropriations would also be reduced twenty thousand dollars as well. Okay. So uh, I can make those. I, and I, I do want to say, as I said, I support the concept of that position. Um, I do want to see. I know that. Kate Hamilton has spent a lot of time on this. I know that the chief has, and we're going to talk about it later. But I'm just saying now, this is about the finances. This is not about the position in terms of my vote. And, and like I said, the only reason that it was in here was because those two discussions, the budget discussion and the position discussion, were supposed to happen at the same time. And then when one dropped off, I moved forward with the budget and then I didn't remove it when we brought the ordinance from the last discussion, so that's why it was still in there. But I don't think, I mean, we, we do have things in the budget that we haven't necessarily finalized, so it's not that unusual to have something in the budget that, that isn't absolutely finalized. We like to know what the budget, what to anticipate um, of the budget for the year, so. Um, well, and the other thing to emphasize is that we can add that amount to the budget at any time. It can be added and it can also not be spent, but I think obviously council, majority of council made the decision to remove it from, from the budget. Um, so that's the budget we're voting on now. Um, this is a first reading as an emergency, so I will open the public hearing for citizen comment. 
seeing well, in here. I'm going to wait until it's actually on the agenda. Right. Yeah. This is just the this is just the money. So yeah. This. Um. So seeing and hearing none, Judy, would you please call the roll? Yes. Sims. Yes. Housh. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Templin. Yes. Winter. Yes. Okay, and finally, our favorite resolution of the year. Um, Judy, would you read that one in full? D. This is approving the annual distribution of flour and sugar to village widows and widowers. Whereas Wheeling Gaunt, who was born into slavery in about 1815, did through his own wit and will purchase his own freedom as well as that of his wife and a friend, and did thereafter make his way to Yellow Springs, Ohio in the early 1860s, where he became a successful and respected member of the village. And whereas Mr. Gaunt, at his passing in 1894, left in his will a bequest that the poor, worthy widows of Yellow Springs, regardless of their race, be given 25 pounds of flour during the Christmas season, this purchase to be made from the sale of crops grown on what is now Gaunt Park. And whereas residents of Yellow Springs to this day enjoy the benefits of Gaunt Park as a result of the generosity of Wheeling Gaunt, and whereas, as a nod to the changing times, Mr. Gaunt's bequest has over the years been amended to offer five pounds of flour and five pounds of sugar to both widows and widowers, all of whom are considered worthy. And whereas, as the holiday season approaches and we think of ways we can share our love and concern for all members of this community, it is fitting that we honor the memory of Wheeling Gaunt and the spirit of his gift in the manner that he intended. Now, therefore, counsel for the village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, hereby resolves that section one. The village manager is hereby authorized and directed to procure the traditional supplies and distribute them as stipulated in the deed for Gaunt Park and as expanded by council in 2012. Section 2, the expenditure of up to $3,000 from the Widows Fund number 902-1703-54102 is hereby authorized as provided in the village's annual appropriations. Thank you. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. So it's always nice uh, to read that, um, to know what uh, um, we were able to receive from Mr. Gaunt. And also, for those of you who don't know, there's a big project um, being proposed now by the Arts Council to do a statue of Wheeling Gaunt. So we're hoping um, through some fundraising um, that in a year or two um, that there will be a statue of Wheeling Gaunt. We don't know where yet. Um, and it's a it's bronze. A bronze statue mm -hmm. to, to go along with all the other bronzes we have. So um, it, it's, it will be good to finally have a fitting tribute um, to someone who is so important to the community. And we're waiting for cookies. <laughs> we assume with the sugar that that's going to be the outcome of, of, uh, of that request. So, <laughs> um, Any other comments? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, now is the time in the agenda where we hear from citizens about items that are not on the agenda. We ask that you um, come up to the podium, state your name, and uh, keep your comments to three minutes, please. Pat? Uh, my name is Pat DeWeese, and I am a member of the uh, Justice System Task Force. And I'd like to put on the public record that I disagree with Judith Hempling's characterization of our process regarding the data report. And, um, and I found it insulting as well. I think that we did, as Brian House mentioned, um, we have no intention of withholding information from this data analysis. We intend to release the report. We had three considerations, and I was a facilitator, so that's another reason I have a, have a sense of what happened. One is there have been errors in the report. Data analysis is fairly complex, which is why we asked for funding to have the right state, um, whatever they're called, research center, do that analysis for us because we didn't have the full capacity to carry it out ourselves on the committee. Uh, and we have found errors, and we, each time we wanted to know, were those errors, did they make a difference in the conclusions? And as recently as this morning, Mr. Hempling <coughs> sent out communication about one of those errors. He's done the majority of the very hard work on this report and done a very good job with it and has paid attention to the errors. But that is one reason that the committee was like, we don't want to be really communicating a report with errors. The second thing is that, um, the language of a statistical report analysis is fairly complex. So, you know, would the public really understand all the jargon that is in the report? And so we've worked on both 
a cover sheet to try and point out the main points and also just a shortened version of the report that has been worked on by Mr. Hempfling and um, a citizen who's been very involved and who at this time because of the current issues is uncomfortable about the whole thing. Uh, and the third thing which is the most important is we all recognize there's some concerning results out of the report. And while I feel very confident that Chief Carlson will welcome looking at these concerning issues and talk about what what do they mean or how can we figure that out. There are of course going to be multiple interpretations of what does this mean. Um, so I think that we've had some thinking about um, well, how will we do this? What's the best way to communicate the findings in this report? And that's the process that I saw happening in our committee and which I think is ongoing. And I do support Mary Ann's um, thought about going through a restorative justice process because I feel that, um, as Mr. Sims said, we're all learning from how we use public media and what's appropriate. But there were injuries. I think there's injury to the integrity of the committee. There's injury to both Mr. Turner and even to Mr. Hempfling. And I think that that kind of process could help us learn more about that issue and the ways in which members of a committee or commission, ha even when they disagree, and it's not the first or only disagreement that we've had on this committee, but we have to find ways of communicating respectfully about that. Thank you, Pat. Thanks, Pat. Anyone else? Hello. Hi. Uh, my name is Ryan Boyle, and um, it sounds like you guys have a lot of things going on here in the village that are very important and pertinent. Um, but I wanted to bring an idea to your, uh, to basically the council and to the village that I'm doing uh, in Springfield, Ohio. Um, I have recently um, come upon a new way to care for trees, and I know through a friend, through hopefully a mutual friend, uh, Chief Burton, who has his daughter that goes to school here, uh, mentioned um, that I would, you know, maybe find some open minds and some open hearts on the council and in the village that uh, uh, you can easily care for these trees in a different way than we've been doing it for the last you know 40 50 years and um, the way that I'm caring for the tree or the way that this has uh, presented itself was that I bought a property that had a deck that had a that was built around a maple tree and I was washing the dead wood so that it would look better and I went ahead and washed the maple tree that was in the center of this deck well I've now washed 500 trees since then I'm actually doing them every Thursday for the Springfield, for the city of Springfield in the Greenmont Cemetery and also in the cemetery on uh, Columbia Avenue. Um, I've done, you know, Chief Burton's uh, trees, I've done, you know, trees for strangers, trees for friends, trees for family, and absolutely every one of them, all of them, are responding in a positive manner. All of them are having like old wounds starting to reheal, and new sprouts and all kinds of positive things. So I know you guys are, uh, you know, kind of uh, environmentally conscious and and care about the trees and care about obviously uh, the environment. So I thought uh, it would be um, probably good to to at least mention it to you. That's what we're already doing in Springfield with the uh, arborist there, um, and I just uh, thought you might at least let it uh, sink in and, and think about it. And then I've got a lot of pictures on uh, tree washing, which is actually on Facebook, if you guys wanted to check them out. And I also sent some to Brian here before the meeting, so what do you, appreciate your time. What do you wash them with? Just water, power oh, washer. I see. And, and, and the mold and the mildew and, and, and the moss and all the things that, that already are in the industry that know uh, are, carrying, are tearing the trees up just blow right off in probably a half hour, you know, 45 minute setting. It depends on the size of the tree and, mm -hmm. and obviously there's bark that, you know, will, will shed a little bit faster than maple. Maple, you know, doesn't shed at all, but it literally just peels all that, you know, 50 years of our combustion and 50 years of our plastics and our and our you know petroleum and everything else right off of it 
and, uh, and, and literally every one of them. I mean, if you do, uh, I would just suggest that you at least do a test somewhere, you know, here, if you don't believe me, do it for yourself. Um, and it's uh, going to show probably in a season on a small one. And then on the larger ones, it takes obviously you know a little bit more time, but you can you can really find uh, so a benefit there. Thank okay. you very much. All right, thanks, guys. Anyone else? Um, regarding the oh Sarah Morrison, um, regarding the possible withholdings of information pertaining to the findings from the Justice Task Force survey with our police department. Um, although those findings are not surprising, um, that there is racial discrimination coming from our police department having being black and have having had first-hand accounts um, with the police department on several occasions and seeing how they treat me versus my white counterparts. Um, it is disturbing that these statistics would not be shared with the community or nuanced in a way that would um, point the information in a different way rather than what it is, which is racism. Um, it is imperative that there is transparency with matters like these where black and other colonized nationalities are subject to target. Holding discussions about racism and racial bias are difficult and more often than not, white people tend to suppress, avoid, and silence those who try to bring up, the t bring up discussions about race. Um, but the inability to do so serves no benefit towards understanding discrimination and violence of colonized nationalities and working towards ending racism. Um, unlike the first statement that was provided or citizen concern, um, with the exception of the people who are affected by this, um, Judith Hempfling and Dave Turner and John, um, the people that are subject to the most violence are black people and coloni colonized nationalities within our community. Um, so although the findings of this information and the choice that John made to bring it to light um, could have affected Judith or Dave Turner and John. Uh, it is important that we also remind ourselves that black people um, were found to be subject to target most by our police department and we need to protect those people the most. Thanks, Sarah. Any other comments? Okay. Uh, I'm John Hempling. Um, uh, so I just wanted to be clear that uh, while it is accurate what um, Pat Dewey said, that exp um, concerns were expressed about the accuracy and digestibility of the report, um, I also felt like I was hearing um, concerns in the direction of um, concern about the community's reaction to the report. And um, I certainly didn't want, this was not the way that I wanted this information to get out. Um, I first went to, I first reached out to people that I knew and um, encouraged them to write a story about it, um, that they would, you know, get the, the records on um, what was said and um, get comment from everyone involved, including David Turner. Um, and obviously that would have been a much more appropriate way, but with, the, with that not coming to pass, um, I felt like it was more important for me to um, basically inform voters. And I'm sorry I didn't think about this in terms of like, we're both members of the same committee. I actually do support um, council's role in terms of you know, trying to keep its committee as a well-oiled machine um, working properly. Um, but I protest and, and definitely contest, and if David Turner is going to stand up here and, and say that what I said was completely inaccurate, lies and slander, then I will want, want an opportunity to respond. Um, and regarding the errors, I just want to say that uh, I've found and now had corrected um, four errors do the consultant <laughs> up to this point. So yes, I will be creating a lessons learned in terms of how to, in terms of finding these errors more quickly um, and getting them addressed immediately after we get the data analysis completed.
Well, guess who I am? David Turner. I think I know a little bit how Hillary Clinton feels. Um, I want all the data out for everybody. I want it to be clear. I want it to be accurate. I want the concerns that you raised and everybody raised on the open discussion group about fairness and information and transparency. I do not feel, as it said on that, uh, on the postings there, that it shouldn't be transparent and the, shouldn't, and the information shouldn't be out. I agree with what Pat said. It wasn't clear. And we as a group responded the way that we did, not me as an individual. As an example of the data problems, looking at the hard copy that we got in our task force meeting, there were approximately 400 citations given out by gender and 360 citations given out by race. That's a 10% difference in total number. The warnings were 900 and change to 700 and change, which is a slightly more than 21% to a slightly more than 20% difference. That's a significant number that could have a big effect on the ultimate calculations and the accuracy of the charge. Now, I wouldn't be surprised. I would fully expect that the numbers would turn out generally the way that they did in the preliminary analysis. But I think it's important for the numbers to be accurate. We also need to include in that the total number of citations and warnings given for everybody, not just the village, so that we can get a number for that. So that's my position on it. Thanks, Dave. Any other? John, I mean, I, I don't know that I think we're going to resolve this. This is obviously a difference of opinion. I'm not sure how going back and forth about this is going is, is to make a difference. I think it's um, two people's opinions, and I don't want to get necessarily want to get into it here. Um, we're going to talk about, about um, the process, the board and commission process, and roles and responsibilities a little bit later. And I think that's, um, you know, that's maybe the time when we can talk about it a little bit more. Perhaps you all should talk about it in greater depth in, in the next JSTF meeting. So um, anything else? Um, I just want to say that um, your, your name, please, Anne Ann Bolin, and um, I guess I want to go back to what uh, Judith said or what Lori Askeland wrote about the data that came out. I mean, I understand what you're saying, David, but um, this seems like an important issue. Uh, we have sunshine laws in Ohio, which I as a citizen really appreciate. I like it when things are out in the open and and not kind of hidden in a corner. And I'm not saying hidden in a corner is what <coughs> happened here. But I feel like John was within his, you know, uh, citizen rights to uh, issue some kind of a statement of that, of what went on in the meeting whether it was t expressed totally clearly I don't know because I haven't gotten all the you know I have some sense that there's some disagreement about what he said but um, basically he was revealing a public document that was you know the village commissioned and paid for that we as citizens then are paying for and so I feel like there's a free speech issue here which should be considered I guess that's all I really want to say I and I would agree with that and and sunshine absolutely is there I think I think and this is what we'll talk about when we get into the later discussion I think it's about process it's a little bit more about process I don't think anybody's going to sit here and dispute that that this wasn't a public document um, it's it's really process and how um, w the work of council is presented to the community and essentially this was the work of council um, and, and a commission of, of council. So um, we'll talk about how that all works when we get well, to Well, and I guess I would like to say it was always a public document. Anybody could have requested that document at any time. Um, I mean, I think there's a distinction. Right. Um, but, you know, the meetings are filmed, there are minutes, it's, it's been out there for three months. So to me, the distinction is, I mean, preparing a report to present to council versus, I mean, that information has been out there. Sorry, just real quick. Um, 
perhaps my point was this. Uh, I wasn't so much concerned that the report would never be released. As you said, it was always a public document. I could have released it myself at any time. Um, it's, it's more that I felt like um, there was being an emphasis put on uh, protecting the police from, from public scrutiny rather than an emphasis on the importance of the information to the community. Um, David Turner uh, emailed me today and, and said that the information that I released might um, unnecessarily worsen divisions between residents and the police, as well as along racial lines in Yellow Springs. And like, I guess I feel like, you know, this was a report that's going to get released anyway. That's just part of it. But what you actually did, John, was, was you used that information to attack a citizen. You didn't use it for the sake, you didn't release the information for the sake of getting the information out there, you had ulterior motives in, in why you released the information. So I want to be done with this. Okay. Yeah. I'm Belmonte Moyenda, also known as Kevin Jackson. So I, I uh, just feel compelled to make a statement because I may have made probably a pretty strong statement on the Facebook post. So uh, I would hope that there would be concern about the findings that blacks are stopped at 1.47 percent uh, higher, or 147 percent, however that is interpreted, than white people. I appreciate the concern about individuals, the YSPD and council being cast in a bad light. I am more concerned though about the impact on black citizens, especially given the current trends nationwide concerning police brutality against African Americans. When you say that you want to consider how the findings are released, how they're interpreted, it makes me wonder why. Uh, I don't know, what do you hope to, do you hope to present it some, uh, somehow in a manner that you'd be assured that people would not conclude that there may be some racism in the police department? This makes me kind of suspicious <clears throat> and kind of smells like a cover-up or, you know, protecting the police department from public scrutiny. It's the same kind of uh, tactics or responses that allow racist behavior to perpetuate, fester, and intensifies. It, it never goes away uh, simply because you refuse to look at it. This means that black parents will still have to have the same talk with their children about how to survive a police encounter. The same talk that parents have with their kids in Chicago, New York, and Mississippi. I would hope that people involved with policing issues would view this as an opportunity poten potentially do the anti-racism work necessary to bring these numbers down to where black citizens and their allies would not have to be concerned about maltreatment due to their skin color uh, and be racially profiled. I think doing this kind of work would be responsible and something to take pride in uh, instead of shuddering at the notion of being called racist as these institutions are inherently so. So I really, can I say one thing? Go ahead. Yeah. I do want to say I watched this tape. I was embarrassed at how I was acting. I sounded like I cared, I was more too concerned about the impacts. And when I watched it, I was like, oh my gosh, that's not what I remember happened. But I just, I, I'm not really trying to point and, you know, we were all in it together, and the way Dave was talking, the only person that stood out actually was John, I thought. 
uh, and uh, that's you know, and I don't mean to insult anybody on the committee, but that's the way it looked to me that he he thought it was important for the integrity of the committee to get it out quickly, so it didn't so it didn't have that look, you know, that we were being too careful. That was so anyway. I just wanted to say that when I watched it. I was embarrassed by my own behavior, quite honestly. I mean, so, what what so. I'm troubled about right now is that is that there is information out there, incomplete information. We don't even know what time frames we're talking about, and it's I think it's hurtful information. I think all that I would compel the Justice System Task Force is to finalize this report as quickly as possible, so that we can get the final report out there. I I I will not be surprised that to to see the statistics. I will be disappointed. To to see the statistics, but I'm, I won't be surprised. I wouldn't be trying to hide them. I think that there is, you know, if there, if, if there were changes being made to the data because the data was wrong up until this morning, that makes me suspect too. So I want to make sure we're getting the right information out there and that it's so that people, and, and we've already caused a lot of upset and a lot of concern over incomplete information. So um, JSTF, please work quickly and um, let's get it out. And um, I'd like to do that before the end of the year. I'd like to be part of that since that's part of, of while well, I'm still on council. So I don't know if that's going to be possible or not. But um, I, I'd like to end this discussion. I think that we will get into the talk of, of uh, boards and commissions and those kinds of actions a little bit later. And, and Bomani and, and Sarah, I mean, seriously, I, we are just as concerned as about the racial issues, about making sure of equity and fairness, and absolutely understand and know what's been happening. But we want to make it clear that we want to make sure we're working with the, with the right information and that um, we can make the steps moving forward. And I feel like we've already made a lot of steps, um, a lot of positive steps, and I want to keep that to keep going forward. And, and that this report is, is going to get out as quickly as it can. Well, and this is why we established a justice system task force. This is with, why right? the council has spent a lot of time for four years working on these issues. And, and that happened is... before the New Year's Eve incident. So we were, we were recognizing and we're working on this before the New Year's Eve incident happened. One quick question. Uh, I, I'm just looking at the future agenda, and uh, we've got uh, one me meeting in, on the 20th and then two in December. I don't see it. Do we want to put it on there? Well, I don't know. I mean, I guess we'd have to, we'll have to see if the JSTF can possibly be done before the end of the year. I don't know. I mean, it's really in their hands. Could I say something? Uh, you know, early on when Chief Carlson was appointed interim chief, um, I got a phone call from a citizen, and that citizen had these concerns. Okay, these these very similar concerns that are being expressed here um, by Ms. Morrison and, and by Mr. Mienda, and. Um, one of the things that he and I talked about and that Chief has agreed to do is consistently check, spot check, all of the citations and all of the encounters that the police department is having and to make sure that we are not continuing to have a problem that was apparent um, to, to those of you of color. And so we have already taken that step internally that Chief has agreed to and he will continue to do those things. And we're just as interested in seeing this report as anyone else. We just want to know that it's accurate and that there aren't the data problems that have been experienced. In fact, Chief and I have seen the original report, which apparently had the inaccuracies in it, because John sent it to us. And so it's, it's not something that we're turning a blind eye to, and it's something that we've already started actively trying to work on. So I just want to make that clear to everyone. You know, aside from the other controversy that is that is out there right now, this is what Chief and I have committed to. So, okay, thank you. Um, moving on to old business. Um, first item is the job description for the police department outreach specialist. I'm not really sure where this is going to go. Um, who's taking Chief? Chief? 
Yes. You need to come up front. Okay. So uh, I'll summarize because I know we have a long night. Early on, Justice uh, System Task Force came to me with an idea. Kate Hamilton brought that idea forward with some some very credible and interesting um, support material <clears throat> about the Association of Police Social Workers. Um, currently in just about 47 states, there aren't any in the police program. Wisconsin, <laughs> Illinois is the largest, and I believe uh, I spoke with a department in Kentucky. Kentucky has one. So made some calls to uh, different police departments. Uh, Evanston, Illinois, which is a much larger community, but still had some similarities. Um, kind of, I thought, had the best fit, if you will, for something we could do in the village. But after speaking with police departments, talking with um, social services, many of the different groups in Greene County, the one common denominator that departments found using this program is using a specific social worker in the office, one, created a whole different set of liability issues and standards. Um, and then two, they found that that particular position became confusing to the victims and the customers, if you will, of the program um, because they basically were in between the police situation and the end product of social services. So family solutions, housing needs, um, victims advocacy, um, juvenile services, um, restorative processes. Uh, so this is where I started thinking, okay, well, what are some other communities doing? Maybe I'm limiting myself to what's going on in progressive policing by using the word social worker, and I was. Other departments can consider this or call this things like uh, diversion specialist, resource officer. Um, Human Services Division, Police Social Services. And again, in doing this, I found most of the departments, these were victims advocates. These were people helping victims of crime through the process. I think we're seeking a much broader perspective of help from this position, um, wanting to help people who have developmentally, developmental issues, um, mentally unstable, um, addiction services, those kinds of things. Again, that would be overwhelming for a single person to do that in the village of Yellow Springs. But what they can do is establish relationships with these organizations that as law enforcement officers, we simply get to meet and get a business card from, you know, maybe once a year. Um, so I, looking at this in, de in depth a step further, and this is just a scenario to give you, but as a police officer, first responder on call for service, we have a litany of literature and brochures, many of which, honestly, um, we are a little confused about ourselves because there's a lot of information on those. But we keep them in the cruisers. We're asked to hand those to the victims, to the parents, to anyone that's involved. And that, at that point, um, the folks I've talked to says it's a stopping point because that particular information at that particular time is simply a reminder of the bad situation. So the advice is two to three days after we revisit. Police officers can't really do that, especially in a small jurisdiction where we have one officer on, two possibly at, at most times. Um, scheduling inhibits that. Um, calls for service, so I may very well have good intentions on Wednesday when I come back in to go speak to this person, but I can never get to it. So this is where I found um, and kind of created this outreach specialist 
idea. Outreach is a common word used in law enforcement, but typically it's through drug enforcement, um, rehabilitation, that kind of thing. So this kind of covered the gamut, and I found um, that this person would be, uh, as well as, quote, what we would consider a social worker, they would also be a resource liaison, which is desperately needed. Did everyone have a chance to read the um, outline that I put together for the job? Yes. <laughs> so you can see there's a wide variety in there, including things like uh, school resource officer. Um, I don't want to say media, but uh, they would be involved in updating our uh, presentations, our web page, information about current events in the village. They would be organizing programs with, with me through uh, all of our uh, faith-based groups, um, schools, charitable groups. So a lot of the things that I'm trying to do, but it's difficult. Can, can I ask a couple questions? Absolutely. Um, so in the first paragraph, uh, when you refer to social and medical services in, in capital letters, is, does that mean just like external or is this uh, a department or I, I'm just trying to understand like what social and medical services means in this context? Well, is that the resources that are? Yes. Okay. So all social, all medical, uh, be it mental health. So external to the department. Absolutely. Okay. And then in the third paragraph, it is does this mean that um, this is something that the outreach specialist would not do? No. You mean sexual assault supervised by the sworn? Department specialized officer, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, no, that's just that has to be that way because of the nature of that case. So that's that's a current officer that is responsible for that. Correct. Okay. I had a brief conversation with um, Chief Altman, and he said that he's spoken with you about concerns with um, the overall um, resources in the county for especially mental health support and that he was actually I think maybe the fire chiefs in the county were going to get together and talk to whether they were going to talk to the sheriff I'm not sure who exactly they were going to talk to but you know I'm, are you seeing that this might be something that that we could get broader support uh, I mean and I would definitely see it as a potential I, I would assume that this person would be interacting with Miami Township officials quite a bit, Absolutely. fire and rescue officials quite a bit also. And does the county have any one doing something like this? Does the sheriff's well, department? No, the specific, uh, Xenia has a diversion officer that does something similar to this, but started out as a social worker and they figured this out and have worked into this diversion, which will help with restorative guiding certain cases, um, aiding, assisting. If I could read one thing, I didn't copy it because it was so long. But this is a good summary. Um, so, social work practice within police departments. Despite the law enforcement functions that support the practice of social work, few departments employ social workers. We already went over that. Um, Websites show that civilian psychologists are employed to provide a variety of services to police officers as well as counseling. One of the things that I'd like to implement with this particular person that would be a fit for us would be the training that they would receive um, in it, alongside the officers, but in addition to um, the, the training that they would receive in coaching officers through critical incidents. So CIT training will be huge for this person. Um, they'll be in the front of it. I'm sure eventually my dream would be that they'll actually be part of the program in Greene County as it grows because they just restarted that program. We just hosted it at Antioch a, a few months ago. So here's a, a quick example because I, I, I'm simple and I have to explain things th this way for myself. But let's say, for example, we have a critical incident, a call for service, uh, someone um, violent in a home making threats. And at that point, if those threats are 
to the point where they could cause physical harm to the occupant or anyone else in the residence, that gives the law enforcement officer the legal right now to breach and make entry. My question would be, should they do that? Do they have to? Does the officer need to just use the initial training to make that decision? Should the officer make that decision? If the threat is sim simply uh, verbally, um, uh, you know, that type of thing. So their mission will be, they reach out and call this outreach specialist. It's Brian, I'm over here at so-and-so's place. Um, what do I do? Well, what are they saying? They're saying, go away, don't come in. They're gonna hurt themselves. Okay, tell them you're going away and you care about them. And is there anyone you can, that they, you can call for them right now? And start backing up. I mean, they will have a direct path of the mindset that I believe you have brought me into this position to achieve. Um, and, and this is what we lack in, in law enforcement, in this department particularly, because we make split decision uh, and critical incidents that we're trained for and we do it legally, but sometimes is that the right thing to do? So those kind of decisions uh, to me will be the pivotal point in this as opposed to what I think I originally envisioned when I met with Kate and you know we'd have a mental health services office in the department or something that, that just isn't what it is um, well I I read everything that you submitted I've read what Kate submitted I look I went online and I know there's even an association for police social workers so on Saturday, I tried to educate myself. And um, I have some concerns, some ideas, in no particular order. Um, one thing is, I suggest we might think of this as a trial, like a pilot project, one thing. Another thing, $20,000. Okay, I looked at this uh, in, uh, salary sheet for social workers. If you add the, me the median in uh, income for uh, someone with an MSW and you add their uh, benefits, it comes up to 80 some thousand dollars. Twenty thousand dollars is one quarter of that. I, unless we're going to have a really tiny program, I and someone who's just out of college, I don't think twenty thousand dollars will cut it. I have a concern about that, and. Then I, I'm look thinking like, well, let's look at what are the tasks, and then how do we fill the tasks? Some of the tasks are sort of simple, like referrals, checking up, but that split second kind of decision that you're talking about, an officer calls someone and that person's supposed to be on call, that that's going to take some skill, I think. That's mm -hmm. not just someone out of college. So that's why I think taking some time to talk about this, which I I believe all council supports. I, I'm saying that, I think that that's okay. And, and hopefully it gets in the paper more and some community, so citizens start being able to think about that. That's why I know it's like a drag to have spent so much time on this and then have come to council and then we're sitting around talking about it. But that's why I think it's important because it is new, there are things that need to be worked out and, and uh, well, that, that I, I have other things written down, but that's all I'm going to say. And, and I was going to say, um, I, I, uh, I appreciate Chief's enthusiasm. I feel like it's, it's obviously genuine. Uh, and I know uh, the police department is dealing with people, I mean, a lot you're dealing, you know, we think of police departments dealing with crime, but in fact, you're spending a lot of your time dealing with not only people with mental health issues, but also just people with th their social crises of some sort that are happening in their lives and their families. Um, and so, but the, um, you know, I was looking at what Kate had, uh, one of the documents that Kate had uh, handed out to us, which was Lincolnwood, Illinois. And the, what I was feeling about it, I mean, the community has high hopes for what a position like this could mean for our police department and for the services we can provide for people in need. Um, I mean, people feel like it could, it could prevent some tragedy. That's the level of hope that people have about this. Um, it, it may be a higher hope than we're going to be able to meet immediately, but I, 
I, I feel like um, I, I'm wondering, Kate said that she knows some, you know, somebody who could come speak to us. I, I know Illinois, I mean, from this job description, it says they're providing community, they're doing a lot. Crisis intervention, diag you know, diagnostic evaluation, emergency response for juvenile cases, domestic disputes, traumatic incidents, death, indigenous populations, victims of violence, mental health, substance abuse cases. So it's huge. <laughs> And um, well, and, it, and it pays huge. But and, and yeah, but I guess my uh, so I was thinking it might be good if we could get someone to speak to us who, you know, uh, could tell us about you know kind of how it works, particularly in Illinois where they seem like they have a pretty uh, uh, high level involvement. Um, I was thinking, you know, for a person like this to command the author the um, command the respect of the department. Uh, police officers, you know, you know. I was think I was thinking maybe they should be at the level of the sergeants, and they would be a real resource of the sort that you're talking about in these, you know. But it's there's just a lot. Um, I mean, there's well, both the money side question, and then there's also um, uh, what exactly? How should we start? Because I do think it does make sense, and I know you're for this of having some kind of a pilot project. How do we start this? And it's, it's just well, I mean, it's it's what I proposed is how we start it. Um, we, we contract it so we have our, our out. It's, you know, uh, I, I felt a substantial but fair uh, first year for someone to dedicate themselves to the program. Um, I'm on a little bit of a different playing field because I don't, I'm not impressed with credentials. Um, it doesn't do much for me. This is a small town. I think someone who cares about Yellow Springs, someone who cares about people, would would be a far better resource for me than someone with degrees that demands a high salary, by far. So this is where I came from with this. Um, but I'm definitely open to continuing the dialogue. Um, I think this need is here and now. Um, I'd like to bring somebody on, and you know, by the first of the year, if I could. Um, yeah, I, I think that I, I, you know, I think we're all saying the same thing. I think we all support this. What Kate wrote, what what the JSTF has been talking about. I think all of these things are all wrapped up in what in what Brian is proposing, and he's talking about twenty thousand dollars, and what you two are talking about is fifty and sixty thousand dollars. So. You know, it, 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 but yet we're concerned about the PD budget. So, you know, something's not quite, and I don't, I don't know if we want to talk about staffing, and I don't think, I don't, I hate to say, I don't think the contract thing's going to work. Well, right. You know, it's not going to work. <laughs> so, so it's going to have to be an employee. Well, so let's clarify that. Well, and Chris. Well, again, we're still in the discussion phase, yeah. but from the descriptions that I'm hearing, um, I would be inclined to think that it would be difficult to do it without that person being an employee. Mm -hmm. Why? I'm not getting Well, this. because part of it, one with an independent contractor, an independent contractor has to have the ability to use his or her independent judgment, not operating at the direction of someone else. Um, I, again, I, I'd like to, to look into it some more, um, but I, I think that Patty and I have had some preliminary discussions. I've had some preliminary discussions with Chief. I'd like to find a way to do it. Um, I know that uh, there there was at least some early discussion about the possibility of a grant. That's often a way that one gets around that in the beginning. The problem with grants is that when that funding runs out, then what do you do with the program? When I was a public defender in the public defender's office, we had a sentencing specialist who was there to assist the attorneys to work on the just individual cases on sentencing issues for individuals um, and eventually that grant money ran out and then we had to go to the county and get funding for that position so um, but I like that idea I mean if you can get a grant and it could fund it but but still where does that that's the funding where is the employment and my understanding is that there is some issue with numbers of employees right now well it we're getting close to the 50 employees that changes 
a lot of what you have to do with insurance and other things. Um, that rule is being looked at and may or may not apply. If this person were hired as an employee, they would be a regular full-time employee um, because they would have a set number of hours for work every week, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, I guess at this point, my, my problem with the grant is, is twofold. Number one, you have the issue of the grant runs out. Um, and you have to find a way to fund it, and if you're not going to be committed to funding it at that point, um, then that's a resource that you just lose. Um, so the second thing is it takes a while to get a grant. So it is going to put that behind the eight ball and delay um, further implementing this idea. So. I mean, I understand council's concerns about the budget. Um, I understand that the public feels that the, the police the budget, the police department budget is too high. That's a discussion for a later day. I will tell you that um, I have met with Chief and Kate. I fully support this idea. I think that our citizens, um, our village as a whole, could benefit a lot from having this position filled with someone who is able to, to not only help the officers in that immediate situation, but be that person to follow up in that three days. You have three days um, after a crisis situation to get to someone and make a viable difference. And it is really important that we have somebody who's able to commit to do that with every single situation that we need it done in. And so I, I fully support Chief's efforts and Kate's efforts and the task force efforts in this regard. And um, so I guess my question to council is exactly what do you want us to do? Because we're happy to bring you whatever information further that you need. I mean, Chris needs to follow up and find out if this can be a contract. Maybe Kate can set somebody to come and speak to us from with her contacts. What else do, do, do this council want us to do to bring this back? Well, uh, I, I want to say a few things related to that because, I mean, I, again, want to reiterate that I feel like council all, you know, definitely supports this idea. I mean, that's why we asked to pursue this. I think we need to remember that when it was first presented to us, it was, you need a full-time police social worker, right? And I remember, Kate, when you came up and presented that, mm -hmm. that was the way that you thought was the best practice. Mm -hmm. This has morphed, yeah. and so we really have not discussed it yet, right? We've, we've got great information, and so that, I think, is really important. Um, my issue is not focused on the budget. Not that I don't care about the budget, but I'm more interested in, number one, figuring out what do we really want and what's going to make a difference, all right, related to some of the comments that I heard. Number two, what can we do? Because isn't there another issue with contract? Like Susan could not be a contract person, it so it also has to do with where you work. It has and to do with whether you <clears throat> supply them with an office on site, whether right. they have set hours. So there's a lot of things we don't know, and that's why I said yes to not putting it in the budget, because I'm not sure if 20,000 is the right number if we don't know what this position is about. Um, so, very much in support. I do think it can make a, a big difference, and there's probably different ways to go about it. One thing I'd like to do is a little bit more creative thinking. For example, it occurred to me a, a higher qualified person who has the ability to do training. We have budget for training. What if that person was doing some of the implicit bias training and some of the other things? That would be a way to still work within an existing budget, but get the kind of person that we might want. Uh, secondly, um, we are talking about mayor's court and how we want to look at our justice system overall. So maybe we think about where this position is actually located and how it works into some of these other things. So, well, and that well, that is something that Chief and I have discussed is how this could possibly tie in the mayor's court, but we didn't want to make any. Sure. Commitments given that tomorrow is the election. Right, right. But anyway, but those are just a couple of ideas off the top of my head, but, um, but it, it's great. I mean, I love the work that's been done, but I do think this is really the first time we're discussing it now that it's been more fully processed. And I do want to hear Kate's thoughts on this too, uh, you know, kind of fleshing out what you put in your letter um, when we're ready for that. Uh, you know, and I think other. Uh, 
connections like with the mediation program, restorative justice, are there ways that we could use existing mental health professionals in town to work with such a person? Um, I, I mean, uh, were you done? Yeah, I didn't mean to introduce. Um, I think uh, we expressed ex uh, concern about the budget and then uh, you tried to respond to that, you know, uh, and so I appreciate that. And I realized that my own thoughts, and we were going to try to talk but didn't end up having the time, um, has kind of, you know, been progressing as I've been thinking about it more deeply. But I do think, uh, I know Kate had said to me about having, you know, somebody come here and talk to us. I think that could be very helpful because we can really hear it from the mouth of somebody who knows what it's, what the job at least can be and maybe knows more than just one way that it can be. I mean, that would be very helpful. Uh, you know, we've seen paper descriptions, but we haven't talked to one of these people. and. I think that could be very helpful uh, in c considering the next step and you know maybe we want to set a time frame for trying to get to a decision might be another good thing so people because I see chief tapping his fingers <laughs> like how long is it going to take or something like that but uh, so you know maybe we want to you know give ourselves I don't know two or three months to come to some c conclusion maybe that sounds too long. Um, yeah, I thought yes. that they asked you to and you didn't get up, so. No, no, they said one. Okay. <laughs> we're, we're ready. Yep. Okay, I was waiting for you to, you know, just well, jabbering. I wanted to so I was like, trying to be quiet. <clears throat> I don't even know where to start. I'm Kate Hamilton. Um, I'm on the Justice System Task Force. The police ash worker has been the area that I've been working on for the past since it, since the task force formed, so what has it been a year? Thirteen months. Yeah. Of the year, yeah. Okay, uh, and I was also working on this area. Um, I'm also on the HRC, so I've been working on this for a couple of years actually, um, and I don't even know where to start. So the letter that that both of you had sent with your concerns said that this hasn't really been addressed or discussed in the public, and that is actually not true. This has been discussed a lot, and. Um, it's in pretty much every note that we've done in HRC. It's been at just some task force. We've had citizens come and ask questions, and it really has been out there. Um, and in the packet that we have, this is actually was in the packet for the May 1st um, Village Council meeting. So I don't know if people didn't read a lot of it. Pat presented it because I had laryngitis or something. I was here, but I couldn't speak. Um, and Pat presented that. She presented our recommendation. Uh, I really do feel like it's a budgetary thing at this point. I feel like this is sort of a stalling thing to say, well, we don't know enough, we have to go back. And it's, it is honestly frustrating because we've had a lot of meetings. We've done a lot of things. And, you know, Chief Carlson really took it on and went with it. He's talked to people at TCN. We've talked to local social workers. We had them come to some meetings and try to help us figure out how to develop um, this description of what we wanted. So, I mean, we've done our due diligence, I think. And uh, it, it, it's a little frustrating because I feel like as the Justice System Task Force, what you've asked us to do is go out and do all this research. I mean, this is... This is a lot of work. This has been a lot of work. I've put a lot of work into this. Chief Carlson has, Patty has, the staff has, um, citizens have volunteered and worked with me. Bill Farrar did all the graphs and charts. And so, uh, I just lost track. Um, I just, I feel like we're at the point, you know, we were trying to be creative to figure out in a budgetary way how to sort of have a pilot program or pilot person and get our foot in the door, say this part-time person is great and you realize that this is actually helping the officers so much, this is taking a lot of pressure off everybody, um, connecting people to different services, then we could see that the investment was uh, important and then invest more. So I think that's kind of where we were thinking. Um, and some of the things that were said like about mediation and things like that, this person would be the person to direct them to those things. This person doesn't take over mediation or take over all the resources that we have here. This person knows the resources and can get them connected. 
you know, like the Green County Council of Aging. They could take a call that one of the officers has about an elderly person falling or something like that, because they get those, where they have to go and pick them up. I mean, that's a call. Go pick up the person who can't get up, and that's great and that's sweet, but they don't have time to follow up on that. So, you know, basically this person would then follow up on that and say, look what we have here, the Green County Council of Aging will come and they will install all of these handicapped things specifically for your needs. And, you know, did you also know about down, you can get rides from the senior center, just stuff like that. So they would know their people. And if they did get a call like that, that somebody was um, threatening to harm themselves, hopefully they would have already known that person and say hey I know this person and what he what really gets him out of that mindset is like asking him if he wants to go have a cigarette calm down or something along those lines that's what works for him so it would be someone that could specifically do those things um, and when you mention training like someone fresh out of college we have officers doing this that only have six months training to become an officer that's their training and we give them a gun and a badge and Maybe they take, how many, 12 hours of crisis intervention training? Well, if we do that, it, but I mean, just from the academy. Yeah. It's like four, six, eight, it's eight. It's eight. Okay, so they have eight hours. If someone has a social work degree or counseling degree, they have four years of that. We're, these officers have six months of training and eight hours of that is for crisis inter intervention and probably 80% of their calls are social calls, social work type calls. So it doesn't make sense. You know, I mean, it's, yeah, we would love to have someone with a master's degree. Can we afford it? I don't think we can. And that was recommended by every single social worker I talked to, but you have to understand these were communities of 42,000 or more. These weren't communities of our size. And they didn't have just one social worker, they had like three you know, depending on the size of their department. And they keep their social workers 20 years, 22 years, 24 years. You know, the Association of Police Social Workers, the person I took, talked to a lot is, her name's Mindy, and she was the president of it. She's the one that said maybe at some point she could come. She said it over summer, and it didn't work out. Um, and we brought this to you and the recommendation, and it, you know, it was passed to start going forward with it. I think it was four to one on May 1st, and so we started to. And one of the things we had on there was like next steps, because we hadn't done that with some of our recommendations. And uh, we had said maybe next steps would be to form like a subcommittee to discuss yeah. funding and things like that. But when I had a meeting with Patty and Brian, Patty, I told Patty about some of these grants. She knew a lot of other funding and things mm -hmm. like that. And, and she said, well, I can, I can look into mm -hmm. this. That's not a problem, you know, we can start thinking about this. So there wasn't a need at that point to like form a whole subcommittee. I mean, we have, we do committees, subcommittees, um, someone to come in and, you know, tell us what we already know, things like that. I mean, it's like, so I felt like we had done everything that we could in the justice system task force and then it was um, in the chief and Patty's hands, because I'm not going to tell them how to do their job or micromanage them. And I don't know. I mean, I guess I guess that's all I have. I just I think that Chief Carlson has been very receptive to a lot of things thrown at him all at once, um, and that he really did take this seriously and go forth with it. And I think that it is something that could really benefit. And there are creative ways to pay for people. Some of these villages. Um, they pay for it out of their village fund, or the police fund, or they have grants and things that they have found. Mm -hmm. So all of them do it differently. Mm -hmm. so. and, and I did look into some of the grants that Kate sent me the links on, and some of them are no longer active. Some of them, the, the cycles are like a year out. Um, so I really didn't find any, you know, substantial funding for that. I can look again and see if anything new has come up, if any of the other cycles have opened, but... Yeah. I mean, it's so, tricky, because the person... And, and, well, they would be just like one of the officers, right? I mean, you have a, you have a year time period, right? That you're on... On probation. Probation, yeah. I was trying to think of the word. And, and, and Brian is correct that when it, when it first came to council, it came because Brian thought that he had two police officer positions um, downstairs when in reality he only had one 
and he needs to fill that one with a with a you know a sworn body, um, and so that is correct that that you know was the way that it was initially broached yeah. to council, and you know we're not no one's disputing that, um, but I mean we still firmly believe that this is really important and. I'm happy to take some of the suggestions here that people have made and try to investigate this funding and try to find some collaboration. I mean, we have talked about making it a crossover position with the mayor's court. There are pros and cons to that, and obviously we can't, again, talk to anybody until tomorrow because we don't know who long the mayor is going to be. Um, and so, um, can you can you explain what that would be? I don't understand. A crossover well, I mean, because the the, court. the, the, um, the mayor's court, um, the the candidates who are running have all expressed an interest in restorative justice, and this yeah. position could, in some ways, tie over to that. Or um, some people, some of the things that get cited to mayor's court could require some kind of a referral to uh, another agency mm -hmm. in the area, be it on aging, mental health, you know, something like that. There is a tie in there. Okay. There's I, just a concern just about how, how, to whom that person would report to. It, it's, it's a difficult supervisory path. Mm -hmm. Can I just say one thing? I, I hear Kate and I think Brian, both, feel, whether you're feeling like, we're stonewalling you, or whether, hey, we've done so much work and you haven't been listening, whatever, I get it. But sitting up here, having had lots of things come to council all year, and having had this particular thing come pretty cl close to the, when we were still doing the New Year's Eve thing, I, I liked the idea, but did I read anything about it? No, I didn't read anything about it. This Saturday is the first time I've read something about it. You can fault me all you want, but when I'm sitting up here, I, I want the community to know that council is really considering things. It doesn't mean we're not for it. I mean, we're like, yeah, but that's all That's all that's happening. And so no, hurry I, up I and slow down. I appreciate that explanation. That makes so much more sense than the twenty thousand um, dollars the the concern that that i reiterate and just for you for us to think about as the dialogue continues do you know another place like yellow springs i mean i've traveled i've been very lucky i've never found a community like yellow springs it's difficult to use guidelines from anywhere else, especially in law enforcement. Mm -hmm. So we're on the front edge yeah. of this, you know, particular program. And I'm passionate about it. Um, I'm open to talking about it any time. Questions. Uh, half the time you ask me a question about this, I will say I'm not sure. Because we're creating this. This isn't typical. Um, so, so it is a pilot program. It is, and, and you know, one of the things that I, in talking with Patty, and obviously we have been mistaken about finding out, you know, now through Chris, um, is that the contracted approach, one, would eliminate the employment uh, statistic that puts us at that 50 or higher, but two, it gives us that complete flexibility from margin of error uh, you know there's no probation say hey, thanks it's not working out or this is fantastic now we want to bring you in full time um, so th that's where I was coming from with that there's no no other yeah. motive or anything but I do want you to just think <laughs> long and hard about when you when you guys brought me in and hired me, the big concern was my credentials, experience um, in this job, and I said, I, I listed the parameters that you've had in the past, and I asked you, how's that been working for you? And so the same in this. This is a position that I feel, with Kate, we will create and build, and I can't sugarcoat it any more than that. Um, I think we can make 
we can give him direction before the end of the year or make a decision for the end of the year? Uh, the way I, you know, I read the stuff you had, I, I kind of looked at this as a pilot program starting out because, you know, we've got what, 4,000 citizens in the town. I'm not counting those that may run through one way or another and we get involved with. But, you know, <clears throat> with such a small number of people that we're talking about, um, the, we should have some data available as to the types of situations that our officers have been encountering over the last three to five years and then start building the program around w what our situations have been. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because I, I kind of saw it as, you know, yeah, you wrote a description, but when you, when you start having a person sitting in that position, they may look at it and say, well, we, we haven't had, we only had one of those cases in the last five years. Mm -hmm. So while it's important, that's maybe something we, we don't want to, to really emphasize at, at that point. And, and I thought the 20000 when you, we talked about the budget, would be to try to start the initial pilot program and you'd say, well, you know, we think within six months we'll have enough data to come back and say, hey, you know, yes, given what we've been involved with may require a full-time 80-hour, you know, two-week well, position. I mean, but I, it, to me, you got, it's, it, it's a starting, to me it was sense, a starting right? point based upon the direction that you thought you heard from not only council but the community mm -hmm. that you know the toughest thing is coming up with a name for it well you know and then because like like you said you know yellow springs is unique and you know chicago maybe san francisco may have three or four people doing it but we're talking about right. a small a small group and then trying to skinny down what their program may be, the other programs that you think may have some relationship to what we have to try to build our program. So. Yes, I mean, uh, I agree, but I leave a little flex room in, in the fact that one thing I've learned about, about chiefing is life is what happens while I'm busy making plans. And so it will be the same with this position. Um, statistics and, and such are a helpful tool, usually to a much larger department, um, where I see a difference, where I can make a genuine difference in the Village of Yellow Springs Police Department is, is changing the mindset of our employees. And then this position will grow over time with that mindset and the knowledge attained, but I can't tell you what's gonna to happen tomorrow at 11.05. Um, I have a meeting, but I might not be able to go because something happens and it's something that's never happened before. So it's continual. I can tell you, statistics and data aside, and then I'll sit down. Um, we have on average about three visits to the dispatch window a day from either developmentally disabled, um, mentally challenged individuals that the officers assist. It's very difficult um, to maintain that uh, with the few officers that we have on duty. Um, I guess, um, you know, in terms of the, we're a small community, you know, our police budget is 44% of our general fund. Um, I, I'm throwing this out there because I've sat on Main Street at 2 in the morning a couple times recently charting on patients that I've seen, you know, hospice patients I've seen in town. It's really quiet. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, 
then I, you know, one time saw, you know, two police cars sitting one place and then two police cars sitting another and driving down the street. Um, and I, I guess I've wondered about at night that, that when it really gets dead after 2 a.m., I think is when it, at least by then, um, and especially, you know, in the middle of the night in the winter, um, during the, in the middle of the week, um, <clears throat> if we should be thinking about some kind of, um, if it's one way to spread the money so that we can think about a full-time person, because if 80% of what Kate said, 80% of what the police department is dealing with are these kind of issues that a social worker would deal with, then I'm sort of wondering about looking at the whole staffing setup. And it, but particularly at night, I've wonder, wondered um, if there's some kind of a um, assistance program we can have, you know, with the county or something like that as a way of reducing that, you know, second person in, in those times of, of low demand. So that's just, you know, another question I've had. Well, I think, the, Judith, and, and to talk about that, I think maybe at some point <coughs> Brian can explain the schedule to you and that might help you understand okay. that staffing a little bit better because it, it's um, the, I mean this is the police budget is a big issue um, I, I want to deal with it in 2018 it, it has been my perception and it's only my perception that over the last several decades I'm not talking about the last seven years which is all I guess we have data for but over the last several decades the number of officers and the police budget proportionally has increased and that happened um, but we can't really deal with that right now and it's unfortunate that it's butting up that that issue is butting up against this thing that we all want so I guess I think it makes sense for us to be thinking about a full-time person. I, I just, but again, I, you know, um, I'm not impressed by master's degrees or anything like that. I mean, you know, they do mean something, but I, I don't, I don't know that we necessarily can afford that sort of thing. But um, it's just a sense of what is the job. I, I was thinking at some point people were just handing pamphlets out about referrals. And I know that's not what you're talking about. And then I'm looking at this kind of a description, which is really, you know, doing a lot of intervention, crisis intervention sort of things that seems, you know, a lot more demanding. So I just want to have a better sense of the job description. Kate, we, the community's been talking about this, but this is the first in-depth discussion council has had that I've been at. It's, we we had we got a recommendation. We shook our head yes. We asked staff to bring us some ideas, and they've done that. And uh, this is the first time, as far as I'm aware, that we've actually talked about it in a more in-depth way. Yeah, I'm very open to let's get let's make this let's get this train going. Um, so you know the ball's back in your court. You brought this to me to do, and. I'm handing it back. Well, why don't, well, I have some ideas, so why don't the three of us okay. sit down and talk about Could it? We, um, is that going to work, though? Because we, we, the three of us sit down and we figure stuff out. Yeah, I mean, we've met for months. We well, well, if we, I think we can come up with some different ways, and maybe once we find out who wins the election tomorrow as mayor, that would be part of the discussion. Sure. Um, okay. Just to, one last point, the summary that I've given you, look, look at it, look, really focus on the, each segment of it. It's simple, but it embodies a lot of duties. Yes. And right now, those are being covered by officers throughout the day. They're helping this person, they're doing that, they're on a call, someone gets stabbed, they're doing this, there's an overdose. They, I mean, it's, it's all mixed in. Um, at the same time, I'm not sure there is full-time work yet well one of the things that was brought up was maybe we can collaborate with the fire department in some way that would maybe make this a full-time position with and can I also add to that um, I happen to know that the Community Foundation uh, in particular looks for projects that serve the township Okay. So um, that'd be great. And I and I are you? I, I definitely would like you to follow up with Colin. I mean, there might be yeah, some help some with the, from the from the county. I mean, if 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 all of the fire departments, if all of the medical personnel in the in the county are concerned about the mental health resources, then um, there may be some kind of solution, some help coming from the county too. Mm -hmm. And that is a big piece of it. And and if. 
Th this person Re or regional. person person is going to take on things that are not currently being done. And at the same time, this person may be taking on some things that are currently being done by officers. So I would like you to think about, are there ways to move the uh, officers around so that this money can be pulled out of the existing budget? Okay. And speaking of budget, I know that I have, um, I did a historical police department expenditure spreadsheet that I would given to the chief and I'd given it to Marion as well. And I think that I had financial information in my budget spreadsheet that went back to 2007. Um, so that's as far back as I have. But um, it, and it was kind of all over the board. But in the last few years, um, I think it had been about three to four percent increase, which is kind of in line just with inflated costs and such um, with, that are associated with personnel. But I think the 2017 budget was the first one that actually there wasn't an increase. There yeah, was and a I was feeling good about it. <laughs> no. So I do have those figures too that yeah. we could fold in as part of the discussion looking at expenditures. Although I'm guessing that, that you know, I don't want to give Judy work and I'm not sure that it really matters, but I'm guessing that there that you could go back and look at budgets. You could look ordinances. at ordinances, ordinances, mm -hmm. budget ordinances through the years and, and I see. brought that up to Marianne. I, d I didn't have it in my office, but they would be in Judy's office. We could look at final end of year appropriations historically the ordinance i don't know what difference it necessarily yeah. makes but um could, could, any more questions could, could, just could kate do you think that some you could get someone to come or is that i, I can ask her like, i can ask her when because i think going. that for me that would be a because very she's big in illinois i mean she will it, say that you need a master's degree she's it, very into that would it but. be possible to skype someone in do we have that capacity if someone if it's too i mean i can also give you her phone number and see if she'll skype i don't know if you want to do it at a meeting i mean she she's yeah, very passionate about this but she is meeting. in illinois and she does we yeah could, we could skype yeah <coughs> we've got, got an a meeting. internet connection I can That'd be cool. i'll get in touch with her and see what, what that'd she be awesome and, uh, and i d i'm not into degrees uh, but right. skill well I'm skill is important I, I might be assuming this, but I would assume that someone that was interested in this, and I would hope that someone, you'd go through the vetting process, I would assume someone would have some type of counseling degree or, mm -hmm. you know, social work degree. Mm -hmm. I, I can't imagine them not, but maybe, I don't know, maybe they have a, anyways, I can give you any information that you want. I mean, I can cover you on information. So just let me know. I mean, I have a lot of information. Yeah, this is should should we try to do that uh, Skype thing? Like, well, I'm gonna miss the next meeting. It'd be nice no, if it was I, I the won't first be meeting. The next meeting either. I'll get in touch with her too. And Maybe the first meeting in December we could try to. And, and for both of you, I mean, and I'm thinking of this from a different thing than the contract piece that you're thinking of. But are there are there situations where rather than the person being an employee, they they really are, you know, say an agency, it is an agency contracted. Again, I'm still thinking about this pilot idea and I do get concerned, especially about hiring a full time position. We did that once where we had this yeah. totally new position and it, you know. Well, I, I mean, read one, one of the, in Vermont, I think it is, where that Several cities went together, and there's one person out of a regional agency that works with the different departments. I think that was sort of like the, the <coughs> rationale behind having a part time person to begin with because mm -hmm. who knows? I mean, they might just have enough work, or they might say, you know, I need a lot more hours than this. And one thing that had been mentioned uh, to me by the chief is that, you know, a lot of the sergeants are on call at times and they get these calls and, and he gets these calls all the time and a lot of times there's something that this person could handle mm -hmm. you know and give direction to the officers who are on because I I don't know that they get paid for all of their after hours on calls I imagine they don't so it, it would it would take something <laughs> yeah I mean he yeah he he, seems this guy be, probably doesn't he seems to be on all the time <laughs> sergeant I don't know. I think it would be very helpful for them to have. Thank you. Thanks for all your Thanks help, Kate. Yeah. Thanks for all your work. Did, did you have a comment, Dave? No. Well, yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I have several, actually. They're brief. I 
don't think it should make any difference who's mayor or chief or anything because the position and the job are the same, the people who need to help are the same, so it shouldn't make any difference. Not that you make a decision tonight and make it work by Wednesday. I wouldn't be afraid to start small, you know, learn and make changes. And the, some sort of, I don't know the details, but just in general, trying something out, whatever you call it, contract, short-term, part-time, I don't care. Get started with something. There's clearly a need. You know, Kate and company have been doing a great job, and in the task force we hear about it, it seems like, why don't we, why doesn't everybody do this? Uh, trying something part-time, short-term, however it's defined, would allow you to see what does and doesn't work, evaluate specifics of the position that you're not sure about. Things are gonna come up as, you know, you were saying, uh, you don't know that we need this. We thought we needed A, but we need B, C, and D uh, kind of things. Um, my repair business, I've got, I can think of half a dozen people who, there's one woman that calls me at least once a month because she has to have TV so that the voices don't bother her. And if she ends up in a manic depressive spiral, I'm standing there thinking I can't leave, but I gotta run, I wanna run away, what do I do? And it, not that I'm asking you to hire somebody so that I have support for this, <laughs> but I think, I know the, I know these people are out here, you're dealing with them with, you know, other kinds of things, I see them other ways, and as dementia increases, that's gonna be problematic. My mother threatened to kill my wife and hit me and was ringing the doorbell for 15 minutes to, you know, to get to my wife. So I said, well, okay, we'll call the police. You know, it was bizarre calling the police on my own mother. He came and spent probably an hour talking with her and talked her down, but, you know, I don't know, this is several years ago, it was great, that was really valuable and important. So, you know, just from that experience alone, I would say this is a good idea. But with all the others, I think that do something, even if it's part-time and short-term. Uh, and you know, when Jerry's mayor or Pam or whoever, then, you know, they will all get on board with it. I, I'd be surprised if they wouldn't, right, Jerry? <laughs> Thanks, Dave. <laughs> You know, those are a couple of other resources that we just mentioned. Is Green County Council on Aging, the, the dementia group that's task force that's working together, you know, there might be funding at the end of that. I mean, there might be, that might be a rollover kind of thing um, to get into another piece of this. So, okay, um, ready to move on, boards and commission discussion. Have we said what we're going to do next? Just. I think they're going to get together and noodle it out a little bit more mm -hmm. as far as this contract situation and So Chief is thinking part-time is, is the place to start even. It sounds like you're saying maybe that is the place to start. Yeah. Okay. Would it so be possible if whoever is working on this to be sending information to council even before meeting so we can be getting the information about what you're ta talking about rather than the weekend before, Ms. Sure. Sure. I, I would appreciate that. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. What, uh, you know, it, it, say for example, the three of you meet and you come up with some ideas. If you could write notes oh, and send it to council, so we're going. Oh, okay. This, they're, you know, I'm then. I mean, are we kind of beyond is there, Do we know what we're asking for us now to, uh, oh, to, yeah, hear, to us? So yeah. basic, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, I, I'm just going to, you know, give you the warning, the regular warning. If you get them, don't respond to yes. everyone. Yeah. yeah, just as information. Okay, so we're moving on to the board and uh, commission uh, process. Um, I know Brian submitted um, the bulk of the information, so I think I'll turn it over to him, and he had also prepared it previously, so I'll turn it over to Brian. Yeah, uh, Marianne and I, wor I worked on that, uh, sort of streamlining our most of our commission ordinances uh, for a couple years, uh, went through a lot of iterations. Um, I will just kind of highlight that in my mind, there are a couple things that we need to resolve. And in my document, I did kind of refer to the disconnect, um, which is uh, sort of recognizing that we do have two uh, uh, quasi-judicial uh, commissions that are required by state law. The ORC, that's the Planning Commission and the Board of Zoning and Appeals. So, uh, you know, admittedly, and I think council has recognized, there are some distinctions there. 
<clears throat> that does not mean the council doesn't still have a responsibility for all its commissions in terms of uh, appointments and, and that sort of thing. So, you know, there is this process piece that applies across the board. Um, but I also took this opportunity to, you know, notice a couple other things that we need to be mindful of in our ordinances, like the requirement of a treasurer if you have a budget, uh, like, you know, some of the other budget things that we decided on. Um, and, you know, within this, if we are talking about making some changes, we need to update, update those ordinances as well. Um, so, I guess with that, uh, I'm kind of, I, I would like to hear a little bit um, from Judy about what she prepared and some of those process issues. Um, Chris, I don't know if, if you, I think you guys had worked on a few things related to the commission, so. We certainly had some discussions about the third time. Okay, so I'd like to hear comments from you as well, and then um, maybe we can dig into what the, the key issues are, so. But in my mind, it's sort of a distinction between, um, yes, there are differences in these kind of two types of commissions that we have, but there is also this overall responsibility of council um, because ultimately we are the elected officials. So uh, I don't know if Chris or Judy should talk next. Whichever one of you. Well, the, uh and I'm working off of a long memory here that's been refreshed by the information that you provided in the packet, Brian. Um, I think that uh, this has been a discussion that it occurred a few years ago, as you referenced it, at a council retreat. Um, I think that your summary accurately reflects what the intention of the charter is as it relates to boards and commissions. Um, and um, I think that there has been uh, a need, and I think again you pointed this out, to come back and, and refine that to make sure that there's more clarity on that. Um, the, uh, when I read through the, the, the material in the packet, I was struck by a couple things. One which was the, the interplay between the, the main council liaison and the alternate council member, the interviewing process, um, the recognition that BZA and Planning Commission are slightly different. Those two positions rise to the level of a public official because of particularly planning commission because of the deliberative part of it. Um, the other commissions are volunteer commissions that as they are advisory, they are not public officials in, in, as we think of them. Um, those are volunteer positions and, um, and yeah. They act with at the discretion of, of council in the sense that they're making recommendations that you're asking them to engage in. And I think that that's a, a, a distinction that, that kind of needs to be emphasized. That they are, the idea here is that they are, um, when I say an advisory body, they're, they're there to supplement information and knowledge for the benefit of council to make more informed decisions. And I, I think that. Um, that going back and revisiting these these principles uh, on occasion is probably a healthy process, particularly when you have turnover of council, and that's about to occur here. Um, and so I think the timing of this discussion is is appropriate. Okay. So Judy, do you want to kind of walk us through the uh, some of the points that you made related to process? Um, well, it's, uh, I mean, it, every one follows generally the, the same uh, process. I mean, things have gotten a little, much more pulled in, in order since you revised the board and the board and commissions and, and standardized them to, to an extent. So a person's asked, do you want to continue? If they do, they send an email in to say, hey, I would like to continue. Positions are advertised. Um, generally two weeks. Um, then Brian had asked that these, this be expanded to include village sites, including that Facebook page, more information offered. Uh, that was done in the last instance. Uh, as soon as information comes in, information is disseminated immediately back out to the council uh, rep and alternate saying, here are your people. Those go out immediately. Um, 
and, along with a response right back to that candidate saying, We've gotten your information, You'll, you should be hearing from your council uh, liaison shortly. Let me know if you do not. Um, then there's some follow up with the council member to see, do you want me to set these up? Do you want to set these up? Interviews are supposed to occur in a timely fashion. Information then has to come back to the clerk again to say, here's what we've got, here's who we'd like, here's who we'd like to nominate. Uh, that has to be sat on until council actually says, yep, indeed, that's who we want. And then uh, letters go out to folks saying, uh, you were not selected this time, or you've been selected and here's a packet of information and a bunch of other stuff that goes out. So essentially that's how that works. But would you say that the fact, because you said, you know, sometimes council does it, sometimes you do the communication, would you say that, that that's actually a problem because there isn't any consistency? I mean, it seems to me that we should have some consistency just so that everybody knows what their job is. Well, I mean, I proposed a solution because I have to tell you, it is like herding jello shaped cats. <laughs> it is really not very workable to say, okay, you have four people to interview and there's two of you guys and you work uh, from noon to seven every day and you work from three to seven, 1,700 and I mean, people are all over the map. So my solution to that was to say, if you want me to set these up, they should happen on the fourth Monday of every month and they should happen between six o'clock and 9 p.m. because you're all free at that time and that's what happens. And we eliminate any other variables. Um, and everyone knows these are when interviews occur, you just do that then. Otherwise, it's up to the council rep and the alternate to get with the people who need interviews and figure it out for themselves and get information back to me. But um, yeah, people do fall through the cracks because different modes of communication are used. I always use email and phone calls, those always get documented. If a council person's communicating with someone and they don't copy back to me, then okay, we don't really want anyone asking for your personal phone records because it's a public document at this point. I mean, I, I do think that the clerk needs to be kept in the loop for any communication with any, any of those. It is simpler to just say any interview that needs to occur is going to be at this time, this place. If you've applied for a position, here's when it's going to happen. That means the rep needs to free up that time and so does the person being interviewed. That's the only way to eliminate any of those variables. And you know, it, it just popped into my head, maybe it could also be linked to the time that that commission meets. Except, you know, like, I mean, like happened right before or something like that, because we also, you know, those, the folks should be available then. But anyway, I mean. Well, and, and, you know, there was a little bit of an extreme example, because, for example, Justice System Task Force was a honk load of interviews that all needed to be scheduled. Mm -hmm. That That's very rare. Right. Usually it's between two and four four, maybe five interviews that need to occur. So um, we have like library commission coming up. Yes, well, they're all up. At, yeah. <laughs> um, well, one thing, um, I guess, um, I mean, Judy told me, you know, I need to have, because I was setting up the times uh, for the planning commission uh, people. And um, I was not copying Judy, and so I had to go back through all my emails and all my contacts and send that all to her. So, um, but I know Monday night, the, you know, that's a great idea, but I know I'm not going to be able to do that all the time. So, um, but I like the idea of maybe trying to link it to the actual meeting. Um, one thing, I'm feeling kind of bad about the Library Commission because I've just been so busy that, um, uh, you know, I, I don't want people to feel offended of, for me personally, if I don't get back to them very quickly, so I, so that's one kind of question. You know, is there something we should should we give ourselves a little more time? I don't know how long that would be. That Judy could indicate in the letter, you know, and just let us know this letter's gone out. You've got a month to get in contact with them. They, they're going to expect you. Is that too long? Um, I, but sometimes there's times when you're out of town, and you know, two weeks is it's hard to make. So, and in fact, I'm no, the library commission people have been waiting more than two weeks. Um, and there's about five of them, I think. Mm -hmm. um, no, I, I do copy the council person on the email that goes out to the candidate to say, if nobody's in touch with you in the next two weeks, let me yeah. know. 
So I guess I was wondering if we could make that a little longer, because I think it should be standard, but I just wondered if it couldn't be a little longer. Uh, maybe, you know, give us, you know, but maybe that's the wrong way to look at Can, it. Um, um, and not to interrupt, but, yeah. you know, it, the ordinance does say interviewed by two council members. Yes. So we have been doing, yes. in most cases, yes. liaison and alternate, but not always. And so that is another thing to think about, right, is if somebody's gone for a couple of weeks, uh, you know, it could be another council member that is involved in that interview. So. Um, well, if the liaison's not there, is an alternate going to take the lead on it? I mean, that's. Uh, it could be any council member. Right. It's two council members. And the other so thing is. I understand is, that, but do we want to, I mean, I would think the liaison would, and the alternate would be the first options. Sure. Right. Right. Yeah. sure. Oh, yeah. And then, but we, did, we didn't want to delay because, and I know we've done an HRC, we, at least the primary or the alternate was one of those that were there and mm -hmm. this board of you know, council members. Right. But, but to, uh, it, to me, it shouldn't be two council members that aren't even associated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I understand. Commission. Right. I mean, um, uh, well, anyway, so, um, and I guess I just want to be clear that we are saying Planning Commission and the Zoning Board of Appeals are um, interviewed, that there's not these automatic, uh, with any of our commissions, including them, that the alternates are not automatically moved forward. Just, well, just I, that we're all clear on that. I would like to that. correct that for a second. There is no automatic. I mean, there was a nomination made. That is the proper process. If, if you wanted to say, we would like BZA and Planning Commission to follow the same protocol. But I mean, we're still going to put the ads in the paper, so we're going to seek other candidates. We're not going to just go with that interview first. I mean, I think that's, a, I personally am for that, because uh, you may get other skills or, you know, uh, that are interested. So I am. Now, that, that would only be if either the alternate or primary's position is up. Well, sure, but I, but like um, right now we have one extra library person who's interested, and I appreciated that because um, um, I was because they had a huge amount of library experience, and I was like, how do we say no to that person? Everybody else wants to come back on, and Brian pointed out to me, well, they could be an alternate. You know, we can have alternates to all our commissions, so we can add them on uh, if we if we decide to have all of them. We haven't interviewed them yet, but that we that was an option. So I appreciated that idea. But, um, but I guess I'm feeling like so just a mission. Even though we have everybody wanting to come back, we still advertise. We still wait. We still advertise for two weeks. We wait for a couple of weeks for people to respond to those advertisements, and then we start our interviews. I would not wait. That is part of the problem. As you get candidates coming in, interview them. It's not like you're going to say, well, hey, let's not interview that guy. We don't really like him, but let's do these three. You're interviewing every single No, I think we should. Absolutely. So yeah. There's no reason to wait. Until but I mean, we're not going to make a decision until we give people time to respond. That's my point. We don't gonna, need to make a decision, gonna give, but we're going to give people two weeks to respond. We're going to get those candidates. We're going to interview them all. We don't have to wait for all the interviews necessarily unless we want to. But um, but but we're not going to just make a decision before we get people to respond to the advertisements. Correct. No, right. It's correct. But you have been waiting for applicants to come in, and and I think these are volunteers. You need to respond to volunteers in an extremely timely fashion. They don't get anything else but our courtesy. And so as soon as people come in, I would interview them immediately and say, we are extending. This is when we plan to make a final decision. This, is, this gives our folks time enough to apply and have time to have seen it in the paper. So you, won't, you may not hear from us for another three weeks, but we've, we've interviewed you and we're interested in you and we'll, we, that is a courtesy. So and so I, I've, I've kept saying that. I don't, I don't think it's been heard correctly. I'm not saying make a decision. I'm saying reach out as rapidly as you can, do that interview as rapidly as you can. If that's not the way that you want to do it and you want to cluster everyone all at once, you might want me to be that person so that I can maintain communication consistently because otherwise you'll lose them and we have lost people. So, so you're just saying interview them as they come in so that you don't have ten people all of a sudden that you have to interview all Correct. of them at once. You've gotten some of them out of the way, you know, as they've come in earlier and you're just continuing to interview until 
such time as it's closed and the decision is made. And that needs to be set, I think, by council to say our decision is that we are, if we're running in, uh, in the Yellow Springs News for two weeks, mm -hmm. we allow X amount of time past the end of that advertisement to fulfill our interviewing obligations. That that needs to be made clear as well so that, you, that people aren't left hanging. And that, that I can then be told, hey, there, the time fo period is up. I want you to double check. Do we have everyone? Have you checked? Have you got anyone else in? That I do my due diligence and get back to you. There's like a double check on that. So if you put an end point on it that's really clear, I think that'll assist in making sure that there's nobody falling through the cracks. One thing I wasn't sure why it happened was I was unaware planning or uh, library commission people were all past their time. Well, nobody was until I went. Uh, I know. I you think know, you guys are all past your time. Yeah, yeah. So I just, uh, so I guess, um, I don't know. I need to maybe pay more attention. I don't know. No, that's my job. It's my job to tell you, and I didn't because I had a person previously who didn't want that done. <laughs> so I didn't. Should have done it. My fault. Okay. No, I not, just didn't know. Yeah, that's I was not on you. I mean, okay. I, that's my job to let you know when people's. Okay. Times are up, and I did not do that. I know every so often you used to send us that little schedule thing. That's mm -hmm. the days, Yeah. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. So it's, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I have some comments. Um, uh, in terms of your, Brian, what yes. you've written, I think that the Sunshine Law, the way we have required people to do it, which is the online course, is onerous, and I would like. And did you complete it, Kate? I think we've had maybe one person, and probably Pat DeWeese completed no. it too. About eight. But um, anyway, I, I, I would like to see us have Judy do an in-house training for um, volunteers. I, don't, I think we, they are volunteers, and I think expecting them to go online and do that is over the top. That's my one comment. Second. If we want commissions to have a budget, I would like uh, there to be a budget form that be given to commissions at the beginning of the year, a form that has whatever is in it, then it's easy for them to fill it out. Um, third, um, because of some things on uh, HRC, we eliminated the position of treasurer, and so I think that needs to be taken out of the documents. Are you? I wanted to say something about treasurer. Are you done with your uh, things or no? I, I, ha okay, I have okay. two more things. Um, I'm unclear of, about what the process is for someone who wants to go on into a second term. Uh, I, my understanding is that they need to basically be re interviewed again. Well, that's a question too. Are we going to at that point um, also put a notification in the paper? Mm -hmm. I think that's what I heard Judith say. Okay, I wasn't aware of that. Um, we haven't always done that. I think, I think we, in, in general we have done that, um, but I'm not sure it's clearly articulated. And I think that's what we're trying to figure out is what needs to change, what needs to be written out. Yeah, yeah. and I think it'd probably be good to have three weeks of uh, information in the paper rather than two. I've heard that people need to see things a certain number of times before they actually get it, and I don't. I don't think two weeks is enough. So, well, you know, Marianne, I think I think Brian addressed it a little bit when he said, "Can you get? Can you put this out in more places?" I mean, <laughs> here we are, a bunch of old folks going, "Put to put that in the paper." I hope someone reads that. <laughs> Good lord! Well, in I the mean, media. Maybe one of the visions are like, Whatever, "Read the tweet yeah. about it." It's not happening in the same fashion. So, you know, I, Brian's point was well taken. Get this out a number of different ways so you can get folks in a number of different directions. Because in the past, we would put things in for two weeks or three weeks, and crickets, I mean nobody. <laughs> nobody. Unless you had a hot new commission with a fancy name that sounded fabulous, we just got <laughs> nothing and nobody. So are we getting so, more people now that you're putting out in the other media forms? A little bit. A little bit. Good. Yeah. Good. I still so, think three weeks. <laughs> I mean, we haven't gotten any more in the more weeks. But, I, I, but that would mean, like, for example, Nick Cunningham is wants to have a second term on HRC, and we're going to be interviewing him, and I didn't tell you this, but I will. I mean, I'll, I'll send you an email about that. Um, so that means we then need to wait for have it uh, notified in the paper for two weeks or three weeks before he... That'll be final. 
to make right, sure there's but you no can one else. Go ahead and interview him. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. I got that. Mm -hmm. I got that. We. Yeah. Do yep. Back on that treasure piece, I, I just I don't think it's appropriate. I think that should be struck from all of the ordinances. Yeah, that's what I see. Well, Melissa's our consistent. finance. Uh, yeah, Melissa's our finance person. She should be tracking the financial piece, and if there's grant writing or grant requests that doesn't require a treasurer to 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 track those. So I think I think for for a commission like HRC where there are regular grants going out that Melissa should probably be preparing something maybe monthly or quarterly mm -hmm. that shows them what they've been. Yeah, we, and I think we that worked should, out that procedure right, okay. with HRC. But then, I mean, I think what you're saying is that council then sees what's happening since we don't always get minutes regularly, or am I not? Well, I don't know. I mean, I, that's, I mean I, in some respects, that's, I feel like that's up to the liaisons to, 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 prepare, present, do whatever. You know, I, I personally feel like if if a commission isn't providing minutes, if minutes aren't getting in the packet, I think that's on the liaison. Uh, to either to either produce them or um, go make sure the secretary whoever's taking the minutes is producing them. So you know, that's something that I think... Easier said than done. I understand that. Um, I understand that. I mean, that, my current commissions are doing theirs, but I'm just saying, you know, that's... I've had I'm, commissions where it's it's not been... But once we had Luciana Leaf, actually, she's gets it out the next day. Um, but it's, you know, we because they're volunteers, even getting a secretary to do minutes hard. is a huge thing. Um, well, I just want to say, uh, you know, I, I'm not married to treasure or anything like that. I just wanted to point these things out so that we address them because those are some loopholes that need to be closed. Um, and I think these are great suggestions. I, yes. I'd like to ask a question, something Marianne said. Um, Marianne, you, you said that you felt it was a little onerous to ask the volunteers to go online and do the sunshine training. Mm -hmm. But... Um, I, I, and I don't disagree that I think it would be better for Judy to, to do it as a person-to-person -person thing, primarily because I think we learn better when someone's explaining something to us face-to-face. -face. But um, I guess I, I'm a little confused why it wouldn't be onerous for them to have to come in and sit with Judy or maybe even have a... <laughs> no, no offense. Well. <laughs> but, you know, or maybe even have a day where we require all of them to come in at the same time and hear the right. same thing so that it's flexible. Judy doesn't have to do it yeah. 15 times. But, I, you know, I guess that the, one of the reasons we went to the online, I think, Judy, was because we felt it, we didn't want to make people come in and they needed this training. Well, and we, we actually, because it became available, it became a tool that became available about two years ago. So that it, mm -hmm. suddenly it became, was something we could actually say, on your own time, inform yourself of this, because if you wish to join a commission of council, you are required to know this information. So it may be, a little bit of a pain in the neck, but you need to know this information because the downside of not knowing it, as folks on several boards and commissions can tell you, if you get on the wrong side of that, it's very unpleasant. And if you have done your homework, you have a pretty good understanding. You really do. And then if I follow it up, Justice System Task Force had me come in and a lot of those folks had done their due diligence and had done their online training. The questions are different, and they're much more about, well, okay, I read that and I was really confused about it, because what about if it's like this? Great, now we can talk about specifics and really address what you're dealing with as a specific commission rather than starting with, well, has everyone read the book? Because if you haven't, er, we're going to go there right now. It's, it is a responsibility, and I, I think it... Uh, to me, it, it emphasizes the degree of responsibility that an individual ha is taking on volunteering for a commission of counsel that comes along with the same things we've been talking about tonight, which are there are certain ethical things that you have agreed to follow. There are certain kinds of communications you've agreed to do or not do at particular times. It's all of a piece with that responsibility. So I, I agree and I disagree. I do think... I, that I should I should be available. I think I should come in. I should follow it up. But I'll, I don't know that I would stop asking people to do it. I mean, it uh, that segues nicely into you know I put the roles and responsibilities in here, 
um, you know, uh, for a variety of reasons. And there's also the Appendix A. If you look at that's the one that's got the Yellow Springs logo and the um, watermark. And I mean, it, it's if you look at under responsibility, because um, this was all, you know, Marianne and I worked through this, and it provides behaviors, uh, you know, such as. I explicitly state that my personal opinions do not re represent the agency's position and do not allow the inference that they do. I mean, so this is one of the things that all of our commission members read, sign, and I mean, you know, it addresses these things. So I'm kind of with Judy on, I see two sides to this, and I do worry about as we start to, I don't know, uh, make have less responsibility, what kinds of issues uh, are going to arise? Well, setting the sunshine thing aside for the minute, uh, the issue that came up with the, the post on Facebook, um, I think from what I've heard from council members is we have different opinions about was that okay or not okay. Mm -hmm. And I don't think at 5 after 10 is the time for us to talk about it, but I do think it's important to, for us to talk about yes. it. Yes. Not now. Yes. And I do, since Kate's still in the room, I do want to compliment Kate because Kate does this on social media. And, you know, so. Does what? Makes that, Makes that distinction. Makes that distinction. Please. On your commission for responsibility, I'm not going to argue with that. We just don't want to. It says on this uh, almost the last bullet, let's say it's one, two, three, four. What's that bullet? Mm hmm. I'm sorry. The fourth bullet, it says uh, benefit the commissioner or her family. I would suggest that you change that to there so there's, it's not gender specific. That's, Thanks. That's the only place where it's gender specific. Cool. And I know that's just a tiny thing. Yeah. And actually, back when I did it, I was thinking more of pre preferring the feminine since historically the masculine was preferred. But yes, that's a great suggestion. And Thank I know you. that's kind of picky, but No. Okay, so I, I will propose an action step that I can um, work on with Judy is this timeline. And based on the comments that I've heard, we can think about just sort of like what those, you know, when we'll you apply, when you get interviewed, yes, how long the advertisement is. So we can come back to council with that. And I also think it would be great to resolve some of these other issues, Marianne, like what you mentioned before the end of the year. And I think we should. To talk yeah. with you if you want to yeah. come back to council with Great. some Cause I think it would discussion be... points. Sure. I mean, I will say that I I understand and I think in very vague terms, potentially this addresses the issues that have happened. I don't think it's specific enough personally because I think you could you could find justification for, for John to write the post he wrote just as much as you could say it was inappropriate for him to write the post he wrote. So I think I think th this document is a little too vague. I think mm -hmm. I think it's a little too touchy feely. I don't think it I don't think it it is specific enough to issues. I think there's a lot of repetition. I think there's a lot of thing that doesn't that doesn't necessarily apply to the village. So I would if you're going to keep something like this, I would consider making it more a little bit more consistent, not not just use an existing document. Now remember, we had a whole group that refused to sign mm -hmm. the original document because they thought it was too restricted and we need to stop. So. Well, I, I was going to say if we're going to put if. if Council's going to no, no, no. I appreciate that. No, I just was going to say if council's going to uh, consider rep uh, restrictions on people's, ex you know, I think we should be getting some a little bit of legal input as well. Well, I, but I think I mean I remember I don't know I don't know what's happening now, but I remember back and you were there, Judith, when we when we had our first meeting with. Um, John Chambers when we were first on council mm -hmm. and it, you know the kind of ethics the sunshine law was our all-day right. orientation and and you know the kind of things it was you know he said even executive session there is no way to absolutely mandate that council keep 
quiet what's said in executive session. It's, it's a matter of trust and it's a matter of respect. I think a, that's what a lot of this is. I think that's what the issue is that we're talking about on Facebook. It, as we've clearly pointed out, it's a, it was a public record. So I think it's I think that the, the discussion that needs to happen and the understanding that needs to happen is is what working on a commission is about. So it's almost like commissions need to have a slight orientation. Commit commission members need to have a slight orientation. It doesn't need to be all day, but it seems like that could perhaps include um, um, the maybe it be with the pre, with the chair of the commission and the liaison or something. But just to say, this is what your actions mean, and this is this is what your responsibility is, and this is, um, you know, the reason not to release this information is because the whole group hadn't approved it or or didn't feel it was ready for release, and by not by not by you know by not by releasing it before the rest of the group. You you know you potentially upset that upset the whole commission. I mean, it's just understanding what what working in a government agency you know working basically under the guise of government. So your sunshine law, um, ethics, all of those things. I feel like people need to understand that, and I don't think that some of them actually do understand um, what it can mean. Well, there's a piece missing from this because JSTF did receive that training, did receive that information. The, but the thing that, that isn't here is what happens when you do? So you do it. So what? What's in here? There's, there's nothing that says what happens next. Will there be further training provided to that individual so that maybe that doesn't occur again? Are they censured? Are they removed? There isn't any next step. I think that's where everyone's sort of going, well, gee, we're not. Be um, hmm. I, do do? I don't, I mean, I think that I appreciated what Jerry said earlier. Um, you know, you're not going to mandate, you can't mandate particular behavior from people when they, you know, if they feel like there's some moral reason they need to do something different, but it's a learning, I think there's a learning curve here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you try to encourage, I think we have encouraged through the way we function uh, a really, um, you know, we debate issues actively, we disagree, and we do it with respect. I think we're a very functional council, and I think people learn that through example, you know, but people make mistakes too, but, you know, it's like, you know, you, you know so people, hopefully they learn, hopefully the whole community or the whole commission learns through if there is mistakes. And I think, you know, that's how we go forward. Unless, something, unless someone does something really egregious, you know, that, uh, I mean, I, and that's a judgment call too. Uh, and then at that point, you know, council might want to, you know, take some action. But I think it's hard to legislate perfect judgment among people who have a lot of issues that they're trying to, you know what I mean? Who of us has perfect judgment? But I'm just saying people are trying to make the best decisions and sometimes they make mistakes. So I, unless they're just insulting people, you know, for the reason of insulting people or something like that, I, I, I think we need to make some room for the mistakes people make. So what's going to be the next step? So Mary we're going to... Yeah, so the timeline, Judy and I will work on bring back to council. I think we can do that for the next meeting. That's the simpler one. And then, yeah, Marianne and I will work on the roles and responsibilities and that kind of piece and some and of the more policy. Maybe that'll be December 4th. Sure. Yeah, because I... She's not going to be here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I'll be here. I won't be here for November. I know, that's what I meant. November. You're not going to be here next week. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. so it seems like the timeline is probably... You can look at that when you at the next meeting. But is it okay if Brian presents the timeline? Brian and Judy present that at the next meeting, and yeah, and you guys. I'll get a chance to look at it, and if I have yeah. any input, yeah. I'll let you know. Yeah. yeah, but I think it's. I just won't have a chance to be here for it. Since you two will be contending members on council, <laughs> to really look at stuff. We're gonna miss you, Jerry. <laughs> yeah, I mean because you know, I just hate to prove something that then you guys. Decide you want to change it at the first of the year, you know. So, well, they'll have time to give input. It's just that we'll just get one piece out there, out there, at least presented. Yeah. And yeah, I just want to make sure that we've got your comments. Thank sure. You. Yeah. Okay. Right. And and again, you know, I think it's important that we 
wrap this up for the new configuration of council because no need to mess with that with everything else. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Um, Marianne, are you going to yeah. do? Yeah. Um, so Community Solutions two weekends ago had a conference called the Economics of Happiness. Now, we don't usually think of economics and happiness exactly in the same thing. And actually this title was um, developed by Helena Hodge Norberg, that's her name, and, and there have been more than one conference with that name. The idea is that global capitalism has not been really creating much happiness and that we've become entrapped in global capitalism and we need to start focusing on local economy and that that's what's meaningful to us. So there, there were a number of uh, workshops at the conference on how to invigorate local economy and one of the biggest ones was about local investing and local food, food to farm things. I didn't want to go into the to the, what happened to the conference particularly. I just wanted to note that it happened and that next year when we start setting our goals, I really would like to see our economic development goals be really focused locally because I think when we focus locally, we can move off of this uh, division we've had in this community by people who are looking, well, we need to bring in this, we need to bring in this, and then the other people who, no, 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 we're not going to bring anyone in, it'll be big box stores, et cetera. But I think everyone can come together around local localism. I think community solutions can be helpful, and I'm interested in it as well. And that's it. Thanks. Great, thanks. Um, and then on the evaluation process for staff, because of the fact that we have both, both Judy and Patty's evaluations um, are coming towards the end of the year. Judy's especially, Patty's we agreed that we were going to do, um, revisit her evaluation and we want to do that with the five of us who have been working with them um, for the past year rather than a new council. So um, one of the things we want to do is to do a 360 with staff or that's what I'm asking is should we do a 360 with staff for Patty is one of the things um, that and then also my proposed schedule is that December 4th we do the evaluate we meet early uh, in executive session for Patty and December 20th for Judy and I'll get out the evaluation forms Brian has found the three the 360 forms Okay. Does that work for everybody? Sure. Yes. Okay, cool. Okay, manager's report. Well, it's a long one this time. Um, the, I, you can see that I'm still waiting on um, uh, some information from some of the uh, local farmers who used to lease our land about a cover crop. It is still harvest time for them. There's still a lot out in the field. Um, but I have contacted three um, three different farmers to try to get a quote on that. I think council does need to keep in mind that um, it, it, we're talking about 73 acres here total. So that's uh, quite a bit. Now anything that was in bean um, and farm bar flatters, that should come back as grass as it is now um, because of the way they did a no-till, um, a no-till um, planting there. But um, I am still waiting on, on those quotes. The solar array ribbon cutting went very well. It was windy and it was damp, um, but Judith spoke, uh, Car uh, Brian spoke, um, all council members were there. We had a pretty good group of people there. Um, and so everyone was very excited and it went really well. Um, Congratulations to electric crew member Ben Sparks, who was awarded the AMP Hard Hat Award for Safety for 2017. Um, ben, ben <coughs> excuse me, is very safety conscious, and we congratulate him on his award. We have decided to delay the ribbon cutting ceremony on the water plant until spring for a variety of reasons. Uh, Brad wants to get all the bugs worked out in his new uh, plant and, and get a little grass seed down <laughs> so it looks nice for everybody. 
Um, as uh, Mary Ann noted, I went to the ICMA conference in San Antonio, as did Melissa. Um, the sessions that I attended were on implicit bias, um, the desalination of water, which included a tour of their plant that they had there, disaster preparedness, changing roles in law enforcement, and managing misinformation. I brought back a lot of vendor information for Public Works, and I sent Chief a bunch of references on where we could potentially get some implicit bias training for our officers. Um, so hopefully, um, and as Marianne noted, I, I was uh, amongst many other people recognized for uh, 30 plus years of public service. To the two gentlemen who got the 50 year awards, more power to you. <laughs> um, because that, that's a really long time and, and uh, I do congratulate them. Uh, the bids on the crew quarters are due by November 14th. Johnny swears we're going to have a, a resolution to award the project on November the 20th. Um, I think that's a bit ambitious to check references and make sure your bid tabulation is correct, but he promises me it's going to get there. So, um, Jason Hamby, uh, along with Wendy Van Buren, who's been mentioned a couple of times this evening, um, uh, from the Ohio Department of Natural Resources and our own tree committee have completed a hazard street tree inventory. Um, there are about 20 trees that need to be either trimmed up or removed completely over the next two years. Uh, village, or Wendy did express kudos to the village crew because she felt they had done a pretty darn good job of maintaining our trees over the years. The Bryan Center generator uh, was replaced yesterday. It is not actually running yet because we can't do that until we have the state inspection, which happens on the 8th, Wednesday. Um, that and uh, once that's done, they'll gas it up and we'll make sure that we can get about 15 minutes out of the old one where, so we can switch it over but um, kudos to the electric crew for all the work they've done on that. A reminder that November is the last month that Rumpke will pick up yard waste on the last Friday of the month if they are in the proper bags uh, which you can buy at the utility office. And a couple of up upcoming topics that we have. Um, I will be preparing a report on our leadership training that we did as a staff. Um, I started work on that already, and I will have that in the next packet. I think it's a topic uh, for old business you know, at the next meeting. Um, earlier this year, the state legislature passed a bill governing small cell, cell towers and antennas in the right-of-way. It actually um, limits what we can do as a municipality, bless you, Judy, um, to um, to control that, and so staff is working with legal on a uh, on a draft ordinance to bring to you um, to do what we can to minimize the impact of those things in our rights of way. Um, we've been staff has been also reviewing the Bryan Center special event policy from beginning to end. Um, a couple of things that have come up regularly are. Um, revamping the event form which is already underway after staff discussed it last week in staff meeting and um, we may we may ask council we may want to set a deadline in advance for people to let us know about their events so that they can get through staff and we can get the planning and make sure they have everything they need but we also have seriously considered coming to staff or to council and asking to create a permanent event space um, so that we can install electric and um, possibly restrooms and make, if you want to have an event, here's a place to have your outdoor event um, where you can have water or, you know, restrooms and electric and staff doesn't have to consistently move those things around um, for smaller events. So we may be coming back to you with that. Um, two other things, um, as everyone knows, the housing needs assessment um, the uh, survey ended on Friday. Um, as of Friday at 1 o'clock, um, there were 23 stakeholder interviews and 528 resident surveys. I have about another 100 hard copy resident surveys sitting in my office that I have to mail to them, so we had a pretty mm -hmm. darn good response. Um, and the last thing is that um, at the next meeting, Melissa and I will be bringing a brief to council um, about staff increases for 2018. Okay. Thank you, Melissa. 
Okay, uh, two sidewalk projects that are underway, um, well, one's underway and one's delayed. Um, the Xenia Avenue sidewalk ramp project, that was um, actually being coordinated through Green County through the CDBG grant. That was supposed to start uh, two weeks ago, but they've had some um, scheduling issues with the contractor, so hopefully once we have a firm, another firm date for that, we will send out another letter to all the residents in that area that will be impacted along Xenia, Xenia Avenue. Safe routes to school out on Fairfield is, um, construction is underway on, um, on that project that was talked about earlier. And the long-awaited utility billing software conversion will be November 17th. So I'm super pumped about that. So that's it for me. Great. Chief? Oh, I just want to point out we have a picture of Ben receiving his award up on the screen. Mm -hmm. so. <clears throat> we started, um, police department is proud to announce, we started <laughs> interviews for the corporal position last week. Mm -hmm. Um, we will have uh, our first round uh, test back December 1st, and I'm anxiously and positively thinking that we'll have this decision by the first of the year. Cool. Any questions? I, I don't have a question, but um, I know that you sit here throughout this long council meeting. And if there's any way that you don't have to do that, I would support that. Whether it's giving your uh, report earlier or having a written report in the packet, I, I don't know whether we really whether we need to have uh, someone from the department here or not. I don't know. But if we do, I hate. I just don't like that you have to sit here through that. Right. Program. I mean, we do so much other stuff. So I'd like to find a way that you don't have to do it. Right. I mean, we've, we just added the report, the chief report, after the New Year's Eve incident. We had never done that before. Well, I, I think my concern would be that chief can be called upon at any time to answer a concern of a citizen and, all, and everything else. So, as, I mean, he really has been kind of contributing the whole night. As a salaried employee, I mean, <laughs> sorry, chief. But. Well, I, I, I mean... Uh, I think he's available so much of the time if there are ways that we can yeah, do things to have it not be I, I don't I don't think he needs to be here at every meeting. That's what I, I agree. Think. Unless I mean unless there's okay. some reason, but it doesn't seem like a very good reason because some nights you're sitting there for well, hours there, somewhere. There, there was a reason why we requested because we, we had a threat against the council. And that was one of the reasons why. When John started it? Uh, well, that's why I'm yeah, saying so, if we should know, have a law enforcement officer here, I don't think it always needs to be the chief. But that's why we had the law enforcement mm -hmm. officer. So what would, and what about um, rotating between you and the sergeants? How do you feel about that? Uh, I don't want to do that. You know, well, I mean, maybe we don't need to decide there, this, right? The sergeants would be paid over there's, time. They're spread, mm. spread real thin. And okay. <clears throat> we could have a little emergency button for an emergency. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't feel like he's here. That's certainly not why I think he's here. I think he's here to just participate in discussions. I mean, he was on the agenda tonight up through a good yeah, portion of it, yeah, really. That's... So, um, you know, I, I, I like having the reports. I don't, you know, we've, we've toyed around with moving the reports back and forth. I think the reports, the staff reports belong at the end because I think that the legislation and other things are really what our citizens are here to, to, to listen to. So I mean, you guys can always change the agenda at it's the, okay. end, the beginning I mean, of the I'm year. It's okay. I'm it work. So I do have to leave tomorrow morning very early for Cincinnati for a seminar. So go home. It's okay to go. You can go. Yes, you can go home now. <laughs> yes, thank you. Goodbye. Two minutes before we end our meeting. <laughs> Judy. <laughs> Nothing. Okay. So future agenda items. Um, so we've got uh, 2733 that we heard the first reading to do the second reading of. Um, so we're doing the budget again. We're doing it as an emergency, but yes. we're doing two readings. Yes. Okay. Um, okay, here it is. Updating the nominating petition discussion. We're going to do that. Um, House Bill 179 discussion. 
regarding sanctuary status and implications, leadership training outcomes, and we just added board and commission timeline. Yep. Um, Judith and, and Marianne, I know that you both are pretty strongly interested in the sanctuary city discussion. Do you want us to delay that discussion? That would to be December fourth. Nice. That would be nice. Yeah, thanks. Okay. And we have to put taser policy back on. Right, yeah, which we did. Policy. We added board and commission policy document discussion, um, and then taser policy to December fourth. Have we gotten any update? Do we have any more info information on the sanctuary city stuff? I mean, like, I we talked with uh, <laughs> Alice Jacobs cohort um, who. Um, you took some notes, didn't you, yes. from her? Yes. We had uh, a conversation with someone who's working with, well, yeah, working with uh, uh, immigrants and, you know, around the immigrant issues. And, um, so. Yeah. We'll follow up before yeah. that meeting then okay. and find out what the status is. And then, so then on the 4th, we'll have the that Sanctuary City discussion, um, fourth quarter supplemental, board and commission policy, taser policy, and a resolution for the bid for the crew quarters. Then the 18th, um, Bowen will be here. That will really be the big discussion item. And I have a feeling we probably may have a lot of end of the year um, legislation that we need to follow up on and we'll follow up on this designated smoking areas. Did you put that other boards and commissions sort of policies? Thing? That we did that on December fourth. Okay. Did, yeah, so you've got the you've got both. Okay. Board yeah. and commission policy is December fourth. Gotcha. Okay. And then your executive sessions at I assume six o'clock on the fourth and eighteen? Yes. Okay. One thing, and I, I, maybe it's January, but when we talk about transit, I guess I sort of want to get it on the docket. Um, there is this question, I know Melissa's already looked into it, but I think it's, it's something I would definitely like to get on our agenda, is this whole, Air, Air, we had looked at this Airbnb toolkit, and they will collect the taxes. Now, Melissa went to a, the seminar that she went to. Uh, there were reasons they recommended not doing that. Um, but I think it's something we should look at and uh, maybe get a, uh, so maybe January, if, since we're talking about going back to the transient guest lodging questions, maybe that should wait till then. What do you think, Brian? We still have to collect taxes. Um, I don't think they're connected, but no. they're not. Well, maybe they're not. So, right. so um, maybe they could be in December. December? Uh, Sure. I mean, I think if this, com space, this council has discussed some of those issues, so okay. I. Okay. But that one, if on that one, Marianne it, and I would have to recuse ourselves. Then we should wait. Till. Would be my it's opinion. It's a voluntary tax collection. Because it's about the tax. Yeah, well, I'd rather have five council members. Well, discuss Marianne won't be able to discuss it. Oh, uh, well, or as many as we can. Yeah. Um, okay. If I. Yeah. <laughs> If we did a lot of that. <laughs> That's true. Here, we don't talk know. about the tax when I'm here or not here. I think it's a good idea. I support it. However, we work it out. Okay. Well, if we can fit it, and I don't know. And so, what? I'm sorry, what day do you say? December, discussion whichever one we have the most space for, and whichever. Mm -hmm. December 4th. Probably December okay. 4th. Let's start putting it. Oh, we were going to put the Skype discussion. Is that on? Do you have that? Well, yeah, I, I no. think Kate has to know. check with her person first. I know, but we should just keep it in mind so we don't forget. Maybe. Or I guess just well, I mean, it, specialist. Yeah, we need to. We we should have. We should. We need to put on one of these. And I, so I, it can't be November twentieth. So let's put on December fourth that we're going to have more discussion on yeah, we don't the outreach specialist. Out yeah. And I guess I will throw out um, if we have time to do the complete streets policy, since all of council has been involved in that. It would be good to do that before the end of the year. What is on involved with that? Uh, reviewing it and. Um, I guess seeing if we feel comfortable with passing it. Let's put that on the 18th then. You do have Bowen, which is going to take a lot of time on the 18th. Yeah. So then let's put it on the 4th. If we don't get to it, then we'll delay it. Okay. Sure. Hi. I have a quick question. I'm sorry. Do we have any update on our marijuana company? 
No, this week we are hoping. Oh, hoping. Well, the, yeah, we don't know time. because the state was very vague. Yeah. First they put out a date and then they were very vague. Then And they picked the tier two last week. Those but are the small growers. The small yeah. growers, but they are were incredibly vague about when they're picking the large growers. So I, we don't know. In the coming weeks. So weeks. they're... You yeah. think by the end of the year? It'll, by the end of the year. Yeah. I expect we'll know by the end of the year. And that will probably may involve a discussion too. So is any of that, does any of that come to council? Does any of that zoning stuff come to council? No. no. Okay. Um, okay. Um, can I get a motion to go into executive s session for the pur purpose of discussing potential litigation with our solicitor present? So moved. Second. Second. Wintrow. Yes. House. Yes. Sims. Yes. Queen. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 